afternoon, everybody. We can start with roll call. Councilmember Burrell, Chair. Present. Councilmember Drusso. Here. Councilmember Harris. Here. Councilmember Green. Here. Councilmember King. Here. We have a full committee, and Councilmember Moreno is also present. I believe Councilmember Thomas is also present. Thank you. Uh, we have a full agenda. Uh, Paul, do we need to move to approve the minutes of the previous meeting? Uh, that is on the agenda. That's the first item we have. Okay. Uh, has everyone had an opportunity to review the minutes? If so, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of our previous meeting. So move, Councilman Green. I get a second. Second. All right. Moved by Councilman Green, seconded by Councilmember King. Is there any objection to the approval of last meeting's minutes? Hearing none, those minutes are approved. Next up, uh, just to announce to the public, we're going to start today with a continuation of our presentations from our uh, January 24th public meeting on violent crime. Uh, first up, we have our Orleans Parish Sheriff, um, Mr. Marlon Guzman. Sheriff Guzman, you have the floor whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, uh, members of the City Council. <clears throat> I thought I'd give you a brief overview of the sheriff's office and some pertinent information about what we're doing here and then answer any questions that you might have. Um, we do have a uh, PowerPoint that I sent over. Let's see, where's that at? Is that technical? You all are going to put that up? Yet, uh, Paul, do you have that PowerPoint? I'm realizing I have it from a previous meeting. If you give me one minute, I'll go back and grab it and pull it up. Okay. Uh, typically, what will happen is Paul put it up, uh, Sheriff Guzman, and then you just tell him when you want to switch to the next slide, he'll maneuver it for you. Good. I've been watching. Thank you. Next slide this is our contents, mission statement, population statistics, and snapshot, giving an idea about our inmate programs here, our statistics on employees that are post in our COVID initiatives, our other initiatives, and law enforcement partnerships. Next slide. Mission, we operate with integrity, ethics, fiscal responsibility, and professional leadership. We have a direct supervision jail, and we try to reduce crime and reduce the recidivism rate uh, through our leadership and our employees, enhance the quality of life for the citizens of Orleans Parish. Next slide. So as you can see, these are our annual numbers. Um, uh, the um, Population has been steadily going down since 2005, uh, average daily population. Next slide. Uh, we prepared this uh, last week. And as you can see, our daily population number, these are actual numbers, has also been going down. Uh, as a matter of fact, though, today, uh, our population is not 901, it's 919. So we've seen a, a little uptick. Next slide. Average length of stay, uh, which is basically how long the average person stays here, has been steadily increasing um, over 20 and 21. Uh, some of this has to do with uh, the COVID 
And a lot of it has to do with the severity of the charges that people have. Um, so the longer you, the, 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 the more serious the charge, typically the longer someone stays. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a population snapshot, what we have. Uh, you can see we have about 196 people here that are here on homicide. Rape and sex crime, 62. Robbery, 84. Battery and assault, 121. Attempted murder, 52. Other violent crimes, 18. And there's a group of property felons, uh, burglary, criminal damage, theft, drug felons, um, drug distribution, nine, drug possession, 11. None of those drug possessions are marijuana charges. Um, other felony, a sex offense, a DWI, zero, and other 15. Um, mostly all felonies. Next slide. So some of the things that we've been doing here to try to help with reentry and rehabilitation, our chaplains program provides a wide range of religious and faith-based programs. Girl Scouts Beyond Bars, this is a partnership we have with the Girl Scouts of America incarcerated mothers connect with their daughters through activities, crafts, uh, appropriate supervision. Uh, we had our Toys for the Kids Inmate Christmas Program in partnership with the U.S. Marine Corps, donated toys and gifts for the inmates to give to their children. Traverse Hill School in the partnership with the Orleans Parish School Board, students up to age 21 attend school uh, and attain a high school diploma. Uh, high set preparation, Partnership with Operation Restoration, female inmates uh, prepare themselves to take the high set uh, GED certificate. Creative writing with support from our case managers, offenders read books, magazines, Bibles, uh, and in their own words, express what they've learned. Uh, inmate registration and voting. Uh, we uh, certainly allow all of our inmates that are eligible to vote to vote. In fact, we just got notification uh, from the registrar of the next election uh, uh, coming up in April. Next slide. City of New Orleans NOLA triage team, our case managers work with NOLA based agencies uh, with resources to help uh, our inmates when they get out. Delgado Community College works with our day reporting center, uh, training program they customize for us, which uh, basically helps uh, the people that are on probation and parole get certification for entry level positions. Uh, Goodwill Industries, uh, they have the GEAR program, which is Goodwill Education Advancement and Readiness Programs. This is really a first step towards preparing those that are seeking entry level jobs by developing skills uh, such as interviewing that are essential for success. The Goodwill Pathway Home Program, provides incarcerated individuals uh, in local jails with work services, workforce services prior to their release. Uh, all of this helps uh, support accountability and successful community reintegration. AA and NA, um, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, conduct group sessions for men and women who are suffering from uh, these addictions. The Thurman Perry Foundation, this is an organization that focuses on the needs of formerly incarcerated and incarcerated women. Uh, they provide organic uh, sanitary napkins, among other things, uh, to the jail. Uh, uh, UNO uh, has a computer-based uh, professional preparedness program as part of a reentry. Uh, CADA, the Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse, uh, they provide prevention programs and substance abuse services. Odyssey House is outreach prevention services. They provide free Narcan training, detox treatment programs, distribution, distribution of uh, safer sex resources and linkage to community health center. Uh, the New Orleans Public Library provides books, magazines, and book club support. Uh, our chess program, uh, we use the game of chess uh, to show offenders they have the capacity to identify and modify their negative thinking patterns and behavior and think for self-change. 
The Metropolitan Human Services District provides peer support groups, both men and women, supporting offenders with addiction, uh, mental health and connecting offenders with uh, services through Metropolitan Human Services District upon release. And we also have yoga uh, offered to our employees and contractors uh, to help relieve stress. Uh, we call it roll call yoga. Next slide. So as far as posts, which is peace officer standard training, we have 142 deputies that are post basic and 185 that are correctional post. Uh, this, of course, does not include our civilians uh, who are civilian monitoring technicians, as well as um, uh, people who are recruits that have not yet completed the post uh, and have only gone through a pre-academy. Uh, next slide. COVID-19 has really been a challenge uh, this is uh, our response. 100% uh, of our employees, contractors, and volunteers are vaccinated. Uh, we have monthly mass testing for all of our employees, contractors, and volunteers. And we're actually currently on our 19th mass testing. Uh, we have a vaccination program for all of our inmates, and we currently have vaccinated. Uh, to update that number, we're at 962. Um, we provide free phone services to the inmates while the visitation was temporarily discontinued due to, due to COVID. Uh, we started that back in April of 2020. We extended the call duration from 15 to 25 minutes. We gave two free 15 minute calls for inmates per week. And we provide free privilege calls to their attorney. Uh, over 147 Orleans public defenders and private attorneys have enrolled in our uh, confidential line program and about 700 privileged unrecorded calls are made each month. We also offered 135 free 15 minute calling cards to the indigent that are incarcerated and offered 2020 minute prepaid calling cards as incentive to receive the COVID vaccine. Uh, we've also transitioned to have six virtual courtrooms uh, when we could not have in-person hearings. And of course, the Omicron uh, variant uh, really had some more challenges. Our highest uh, infection for staff and contractors was 81 on January 7th, and the highest for the inmate population was 96 on January 12th. Currently, we have 22 staff uh, members that are positive for COVID and only 31 positive inmates. And we have uh, seven pods that are on quarantine. Uh, we've also suspended family visitation and attorney visitation now is being done primarily through video. Next slide, please. As far as Hurricane Ida went, we, uh, of course, evacuated all of our inmates and any staff with them to the Department of Corrections prior to the Hurricane Ida landfall. We distributed water, food, and supplies to residents. We assisted with the citywide garbage collection. Uh, we may we remain fully operational during the citywide power outage uh, because of our central power plant. During the citywide power outage. We provided meals to city agencies, including sewage and water board employees and regional transit authorities and public works. Uh, we also provided supplemental manpower to the NOPD to assist the anti-looting task force, the neighborhood patrols and elsewhere as needed because the courts were closed and uh, the people that would normally be there, we deployed them out in the street. Uh, we also have our biometric iris scan uh, this is a secondary biometric identification that we just implemented at booking, acceptance, and release. So we can scan someone's iris and give a positive identification. Uh, we have our transitional work program that continued throughout the pandemic. We have 16 employers that are participating. Our day reporting center switched to a virtual model to avoid program interruption. Uh, on probation and parole, uh, not incarcerated and not go back to being incarcerated. 
We increased our MA programming act and activities with increased collaboration from local colleges and universities. I mentioned Delgado and UNO. Our victim assistance program assisted 797 families in 2021, and we collected on their behalf almost a million dollars, $911,880. Uh, we will again be deploying our booking bus during Mardi Gras to assist the New Orleans Police Department. Uh, this initiative allows more patrol time for the officers in the French Quarter. Our domestic violence firearm transfers, uh, some stats for 2021. Uh, we had 11 from the Civil District Court, 13 from the Criminal Court, a uh, total of 24 firearm transfers. Um, this is basically with domestic violence cases. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our law enforcement partnerships, um, we have people embedded with uh, several of these agencies, the West Bank Major Crimes Task Force, the US Marshals Service, uh, Drug Enforcement Agency, uh, the Multi-Jurisdictional Intelligence Task Force, uh, ATF, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office, the Kenner Police Department, Louisiana Attorney General, Louisiana State Police, the New Orleans Police Department, and the New Orleans District Attorney's Office and the Secret Service. Uh, through these partnerships, we share information as well as uh, personnel. And next slide. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, I'll start with a couple uh, members. If you have questions, just use the raise hand option on your Zoom and I will get to you shortly. A uh, couple of quick things. I, I don't know if you were at the opportunity to see our interaction with the judges last week at the Mammoth hearing. And one of the issues that came up was that NCIC has been down for an extended period of time. And at that meeting, I brought up the possibility of using Docket Master and y'all's intake to try and be able to, at least in the short term, provide support to judges when they're trying to get criminal history to do bonds. Uh, have you been able to do that? Has that been a successful uh, partnership? Oh, yes, we, we've done that You know, throughout the process. We certainly couldn't wait to release people or to give them their uh, first appearance uh, while we waited for NCIC to come up, come back up. It is back up now. Uh, and what we did in the meantime was provide them with the history we did have through um, the police departments, uh, as well as through um, what, we, what we get from Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office. Okay, uh, two more questions. You mentioned your partnership with the Travis Hill School. As you know, this council has taken upon themselves to kind of refund, because obviously have been defunded for the last two years, Travis Hill School. Has that been a successful partnership? I think very successful. Uh, we've had over um, 60 diplomas issued and I attend, you know, mostly virtual, just about every graduation. And I tell you, if you can see the emotion and the pride and the uh, sense of accomplishment that these young people have along with their parents. And we know from uh, statistics that the higher your education, the uh, less likely you'll be incarcerated in the future. So it's been a great partnership. Okay, the last thing that we have all heard questions on throughout this entire process is we seek to put together partnerships for a comprehensive criminal plan is proactive patrols. Uh, obviously, it's come up on numerous occasions using the sheriff's office in a more law enforcement capacity, less prison maintenance capacity. And what I guess the questions that I think you, the public wants to hear, and you're obviously the person to kind of give it, is what do proactive patrols, first off, I'll, I'll ask a two-parter and you can answer both. One, can the sheriff's office do proactive patrols? And two, what would those proactive patrols look like? Of course, we did do proactive patrols during Hurricane Ida when the courts were closed. And on an ongoing basis, you know, all of our units have radios that are interoperable with the police department. And several times we have um, connected with them to assist them in uh, notifying them of things that are going on, robberies in progress. I'm gonna tell you that it's difficult for us to 
commit to doing proactive patrolling because as I gave you those numbers, uh, we're stretched pretty thin. You know, a lot of people think we have a, uh, you know, a lot of capacity, but we're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we have to account for vacation when people are off, sick time. So councilman, we just don't have the staff that uh, it takes for us to be able to, to get out there and do it while we still do our job. Uh, if you close the courts, you know, I'll have people available, but, you know, we have to man each section of criminal court, uh, at least two deputies, and then our subpoena division has to give out subpoenas, and then we're over in civil district court, uh, as well as our responsibilities with uh, training and uh, you name it. We got a lot on our plate. Wish okay. more. Well, uh, I will yield to Mr. King. I'm about to, you can go right now, Mr. King. Thank you, council member. How you doing, Sheriff? Fine on you, councilman. Doing fine. All of the programs, you, you named some very good programs. I'm glad you implemented those programs. Can you give us any numbers as to tell us how many people participate and how much of these indiv individual programs cost, like the GED program, I think you said girls, girl, girl scouts beyond bars. So I don't have, I can get you some numbers uh, on participation in each program. You know, as far as Goodwill, uh, Travis Hill, I'll get you all the numbers on that. You know, the really good thing about this is that uh, we don't have to spend a lot of money. Uh, the Orleans Parish School Board, they provide that to us. Uh, only only cost we have is to provide a deputy, uh, a, a deputies to supervise it. Uh, the uh, Girl Scouts Beyond Bars totally volunteer with the Girl Scout leaders. They come, uh, and you know, again, we just have to provide some deputies to support it. So really, uh, you know, same with UNO. UNO's computer program uh, that they did, they did it voluntarily. Came no no cost at all but I'll get you the information on how many people uh, have gone, participated as well as how many have successfully completed. And we have those numbers, I just don't have them in front of me. Thank you. The Ida Patrol, I, I know sheriff deputies that participated, it was very helpful, helped NOPD a lot. Is that something that can be put in permanently? Well, I was just telling Councilman Morrell that, uh, look, we're stretched thin. And we were able to do some things when the court was closed and, you know, subpoenas weren't being issued and, you know, everything was just kind of standstill. Uh, it, it's, you know, I, it's hard for us to commit to that on an ongoing basis. Um, so, I mean, certainly not at the level we had before. How many people do you think you need to get to the level where you can help with more active patrolling? Well, we're probably short right now um, as far as our, our strength, uh, probably about 200 people short. So, you know, we'd have to, to get somewhere up until 150. And then, then we'd have to do some things that, um, you know, aren't really the best, you know, locking down housing units and that kind of thing. So we probably don't want to do that. So, uh, Okay. All right. Well, and you don't want to do anything like that, but I just know it's very productive and it helped NOPD. I see you now. Nah, so yeah, it was, it was very productive. <laughs> we, we uh, look, and like I said, we're still out there on the street, you know, with our subpoena and KPS unit, but the proactive patrolling was really, uh, it was needed. I was glad to do it. And, you know, if we get the opportunity again, we're going to do it again. With the, throughout the city, you see overgrown lots, you see a lot of trash. Is there any way to partner with code enforcement or sanitation to help those incarcerated, help clean up those lots and maybe get some time reduced? We don't want them just working to work, but get time reduced. Is that possible? So, I, I, you know, we have done that. And the issue with that is that we really, because of the, uh, we don't have very many community service workers. 
and the community service workers, it's a special classification that the Department of Public Safety and Corrections has. Uh, we only have like five of them and they're all working in our kitchen and around our plant. Before uh, the population really went down, we had more and we were doing a lot of you know, community service type work. Um, but now um, it's just, we just don't have the, the inmates to do it. Uh, and um, that's the biggest reason why. And so what are those, what, are, what does a community service worker inmate look like? Is it a certain crime they committed or a certain amount of time they have remaining? Certain, a certain amount of time they have remaining and certainly some, some crimes are excluded. So uh, sex offenders, um, violent offenders are excluded. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's also about their behavior while they were incarcerated. So uh, EOC classifies community service as well as transitional work. So we have about, uh, I think, right under 20 people working in transitional work. But the community service worker is a lot smaller. And, and look, we've tried to get community service workers. It's just a tough, uh, in these days, it's a tough classification. Everybody's trying to reduce their population. Okay. And, and one last question, how close are we to getting from under the consent decree? Well, we're like 96% compliant um, with the provisions. Uh, I think we're close. Um, and that would certainly be a, a very good thing, uh, but I think we're close. Um, you know, the, the things that are preventing us from being in compliance uh, are uh, the physical building perhaps and some medical issues, but not on the uh, security side. So with the 96%, how much is that? What's that number in, in weeks or months or years? Uh, I think within a year. Okay. All right. And what's the incoming pay for a sheriff's deputy? So everyone makes at least $15 an hour um, on an annual basis. It's about 34000 And then once you're post, you can get another uh, 6000 uh, That gets you right up to 40000 All of the people who are post- uh, that is peace officer standard training. They get state supplemental pay and no one makes under 40. Still not enough. Last question. I'm sorry, colleagues. Last one and I'm out. Base, uh, what is the forty the $40,000 max or the $34,000 before you become post-certified? What is that in comparison to other jurisdictions? So we're... In terms of other sheriff's offices, yes. uh, we're, we're not that bad. Uh, but, you know, they constantly are going up. So the last I checked, we were fairly competitive. Uh, and then, then what happens is you start looking at other things like, you know, we have, I don't know if, uh, what the right word is. The, uh, we have a little more drama uh, here than, uh, let's say, in St. John the Baptist Parish. Yes, or in uh, in St. James Parish, or you know, so we have we have a more of a lively population, but hmm? yeah, like more violence, you know. Okay. You have you have other possibilities where they can work too. You know, they can work at hospitals or uh, other institutions, school board. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sheriff, first of all, thank you for agreeing to participate. Yeah, I think you, you probably answered the question. I'm not going to be labor questions that have been asked already about manpower, your ability to use uh, inmates for community service. So, so for me, what uh, I'd like to utilize is your resume uh, and your experience. Uh, uh, former CAO, uh, former uh, city council member, uh, a, attorney, uh, business uh, uh, grad, Wharton School. Uh, 
could, could you help me with, you were part of confecting many of the agreements that got us to 60% double the national average in crime reduction uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, you were also part of con uh, the budget, uh, in many cases that looked at uh, community service agencies and the recreation department. I think you were part of doubling uh, that budget citywide, partnering schools with uh, Nord Playgrounds, uh, Midnight Basketball, et cetera. So for me, maybe the best thing we can do is kind of pick your brain. Uh, how important were those interagency agreements and in expanding the force back then when we, we, we could? Uh, and what would you advise especially given some people are saying that what we're seeing right now with this wave is rivaling what we saw then, but with fewer people in the city, what would you recommend or how could we revisit some of those things that worked then in, in terms of applying them now? And especially now that you're Sheriff, Sheriff Cousins. Well, Councilman, you were there as well. And you were right there with us uh, when we were implementing these things. And I, I think the thing we have to do is revisit them. This is, uh, you know, this is not a situation where we can just put more people on the street or arrest more people. Uh, I think some people do have to be arrested. Some have to be, you know, prosecuted. But, you know, we have to give more alternatives out there. You know, we have to go back to the, I heard one of the presenters talk about midnight basketball. Uh, you have to give a smorgasbord of activities. Uh, increasing the Nord's budget was probably one of the best things that uh, was done, you know, by Mayor Morial. Uh, it gave more options and, you know, increasing the budget, you know, having these partnerships with uh, faith-based uh, institutions, as well as with uh, the school board, uh, those things made a difference and we saw tangible results. I don't think you can give up. You know, I remember, uh, you know, let up rather is, is what I wanted to say. You can't let up. This is a never ending thing. You know, we can't just say, oh, we're gonna do this. And then next week we're on to something else. You have to stay on this, uh, you know, police recruitment. Uh, if you remember, we had a, a task force set up on police hiring. Uh, we were on it. We, we didn't disband after we got to our number. We stayed on top of it, you know. Uh, activities with uh, with Nord, you know, activities with uh, the faith-based institutions. We would meet on a constant basis. We had the uh, uh, juvenile um, uh, program where we uh, didn't put them in jail, but we had their parents involved to come get them. That was a truancy initiative. Yeah, the curfew, the curfew program. Curfew centers. Uh, curfew center. All of these things can make a difference and. All of them have to be employed. We cannot, um, you know, you can't just do it sometime and think you can move on. You're given your challenges, does it make sense also to reach back out to our other law enforcement partners to see if, if they can, if we can confect agreements with them to expand uh, our manpower if they uh, uh, have extra uh, officers or if they can expand their territory? Does, does it make sense to you to attempt to do that again, given NOPD's drastic shortages? Well, uh, it does. And look, we have some agreements that are in place with uh, Mardi Gras mm -hmm. that we're going to be doing. You know, I will tell you, unfortunately, everybody's down right now in terms of numbers. You know, Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office, they are advertising uh, for positions that are open, um, you know, and, and everybody's trying to get people but yes, you know, definitely, especially uh, at these times when we are on the national stage, uh, we have to be, you know, looking good. And uh, we do have several of our surrounding sheriffs that are going to come here and help out. And, and lastly, uh, you, you remember hearing those same calls back then about bringing in the National Guard. Uh, what was the consideration given back then? And what's your thoughts on that now? Thank you. Well, thank you, Councilman. I, I, um, I tend to agree with uh, a lot of people that uh, the National Guard can only be used on very limited, uh, 
on a very limited basis. You know, this is uh, certainly not for patrolling. Um, you know, they've been used for checkpoints, things like that. But uh, I don't think we want to have that that uh, National Guard mentality here. So I really would not be in favor of it. Um, you know, it's a training that you have to go to go through to be a law enforcement officer. Uh, and their training is primarily for soldiers. Okay, uh, thank you, Sheriff. Next up we have Councilmember Harris. Sheriff, thank you for appearing here today and my colleagues will get sick of me saying this, but I'm a data person. Um, so I appreciate the numbers that you presented. I did wonder how many inmates are women currently? Um, don't have the exact number in front of me, but uh, it's under 100. Okay, we'll, we'll do a call for data after this. I'll, I'll shoot you a letter. Okay. Uh, what about um, young people under 21? Uh, again, I have a breakdown on it. That's probably about 200, 200. And are they housed separately? Uh, yes. uh, for the most part, well, for the most part, we try to keep our, the ones that are in school separate. Uh, and then the, um, the others, you know, are based on classification. Um, okay. uh, what about uh, people suffering from acute or subacute mental health issues? Do you have a count on that? Yes, well, we have a temporary mental health facility, as well as we have a couple of housing uh, units that are uh, designated for, you know, mental health and then mental health step down. So and two, are, two Bravo, two Alpha, two Bravo in Orleans Justice Center are our primary units. And for those people who are suffering uh, mental health issues, are, do they receive regular care? How does that work? Yes, we have a partnership with Tulane University School of Medicine, their psychiatrist and uh, Dr. Jeffrey Rouse uh, heads that up. So we have uh, psychiatrists here as well as psychologists and also mental health professionals. So um, back on wood, it's been uh, a good. Do you feel like you have enough um, staffing or services to impact uh, those suffering from mental health issues? I think we've been doing very good on that. Uh, yes, I do. Um, you said you're short about 200 people. What are your recruitment and retention efforts? And I say this just so you can share with other law enforcement agencies who may be listening to this discussion. <laughs> well, we, we certainly advertise on television uh, and on radio and in the print media. And, uh, you know, we use word of mouth. Uh, we go to all of the job fairs. Uh, and uh, look, we've, we're trying to get our salaries up higher than they are now. Uh, we offer a lot of, you know, other benefits. Uh, you know, once you get trained, you know, your state pay is, uh, you know, is a good thing. And some really good news is that it looks like in the governor's budget this year, he's increasing uh, state supplemental pay, or at least proposes to increase state supplemental pay, which will also be uh, another way to get more incentive. Uh, so all of those things uh, are things that when we bring people in and talk to them, you know, we talk to them about, you know, this is a, uh, a great opportunity. And of course, it's not for everybody. You know, it's not for everybody. This is uh, tough work. You know, we work 12 hour shifts uh, and, um, you know, not too many people work five and twos, you know, where you have the weekend off. Our schedule, we try to give at least every other weekend off but it's, uh, it's not easy work. Are you, are you competing for the same uh, folks as might consider an OPD or is there any crossover? Uh, there's crossover, you know, the, historically uh, people have come to work here and then transitioned over the NOPD. Uh, and, and pretty much, you know, when you look at other sheriff's offices that have both a patrol division and a jail, uh, a lot of them start off in the jail uh, and then move over. But I'm also happy to say that, you know, we have some people that have made their career here and uh, we certainly need them, um, which is why we have to make sure they're adequately compensated. 
geographically, do most of your officers come from Orleans Parish or are they coming from Jefferson as well? Meaning, do they reside in Orleans Parish? Um, I think most do, but we certainly do have some that reside in St. Tammany and Jefferson and St. Bernard Parish. Um, I'm going to switch switch topics for a second. On page 11, you talked about um, extending uh, telephone calls for COVID reasons. Are, so if there was no COVID, inmates pay a price to make calls, is that correct? That is correct. That's correct, I'm sorry. That is correct. And is your office, the sheriff's office, do they profit off of those calls? Well, is there I'm any income that y'all get? Yeah, there is income we get. It is not a profit. You know, we have, um, I mentioned some of the partnerships that we have. And with those partnerships, we have uh, very sophisticated uh, recording systems um, that not only help prevent uh, contraband from getting into the jail, but also help um, with the violence that's outside of the jail. So those, that is not a free service. Uh, and that's why, you know, there's a charge. Uh, now, certainly there are a couple of jurisdictions uh, across the country that have got, done away with the charge and we can certainly do away with the charge. Uh, we computed that it's probably about uh, right under 2 million if we, if we didn't, uh, we had to pay for it as well as the expenses that we have connected with it. What, what does the inmate pay, do you know? Um, trying to remember, um, yeah, FCC controls it and these, you know, it's also controlled through the Louisiana Public Service Commission. Uh, I forget what the, the per minute rate is, um, but look, there are a lot of stories about how expensive it is. It's not, it's not like <laughs> taking the whole paycheck or anything like that. Okay. And the inmates do get paid for their services or... You said taking the whole paycheck. Are you talking about people sending money to their right, the, the incarcerated money. person? Yeah, got yes. it. But we do pay um, some inmates to work. That's what, that was my next question. You do pay some inmates to work. Is that right? Yeah, yeah if they work in our kitchen um, and certainly the transitional workers who work outside, they get paid. Great. Um, back on the data issue, we've asked, we've been told about a revolving door. Do you have a, any data on how many times a particular person gets in or gets out, let's say in a single year? Yes. Can you get us that data as well? I, I certainly can. Great, and we'll do a formal request after yeah, this call. We, we have, um, part of our classification system is that we have some people that we identify as career criminals. So even though they might be arrested on, say a relatively small charge, we know that they have a history and we, we provide that history, but we can get you the, the actual numbers on it. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Council, Member, Council President Maria. Hey Sheriff, thank you so much for being with us and for um, accommodating us since we kept running late on the, on the other meeting. So I appreciate you being with us today. Um, first, I thought uh, Council Member Thomas's question was really good to, to uh, go back um, to your time as CA, CAO to discuss what worked um, when you were part of the Morial administration. And I just wanted to ask if I could kind of pick your brain behind the scenes when I think of some more additional questions uh, to, to have a, a longer discussion with you about that. I would be happy to. Thank you. And I really only have one question for you because everything else has really already been covered. Um, I have seen that there are other, whether it's a police department or a sheriff's department around the country where there is booking upon arrest, but they're also now doing rapid DNA testing. Any um, consideration of doing that? Have you, have you heard about this? I know that I, I believe state police and FBI are working on this. It, it seems like it would be something that would, could be pretty beneficial. And from what I understand, that if there happens to be a hit on the rapid test, then a, a more precise test is then done because there are some, um, from what I understand, I'll, there can be some inaccuracies with the rapid tests. But, but what are your thoughts on this? I think it's a great idea. Look, 
we certainly are bound by law to do certain DNA testing uh, upon release or transfer uh, to another institution. Uh, typically, and like right now, we're not doing it at intake. Now the police department will come and you know, if they have people that they're interested in, they will do the swab and uh, you know, as part of their investigation. But we, we're not doing it as a routine matter at intake. We're doing it as a routine matter on certain offenses on release or transfer to another what, institution. What are the offenses that you're doing it for now? Uh, domestic violence, um, uh, the um, sex crimes, uh, and crimes of violence, you know, like attempted murder. Uh, murder. Armed robbery. Uh, I'm not sure about armed robbery. I can check on that. You, you can get me that later, but, um, uh, but is your team looking at doing it at booking for everyone? We, we are not looking at it right now with the rapid DNA test, but let me look at it. I'll let you see how much uh, and whether or not, you know, we can do it um, under the law. You know, it's uh, yeah, you know, so I've amendment issues. Passing legal muster, you know, uh, right. around the country. And from what I understand, Baton Rouge is going to begin. So I think it could be potentially a helpful tool here in New Orleans, particularly as we try to work the DA and the police department work to solve cold cases um, as well. But those are all the questions I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, that the unless Ms. Harris has follow-up questions or hands still up. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir, Mr. Green. I, I do regret that I'm having a problem raising my hand, and I just have okay. one, one question. And um there's just something electronically going on. But I wanted to um thank um our sheriff for his presentation today and for his work. Sheriff Guzman, um, one thing that we've learned during these hearings is the the number of the excessive number of vacancies in our criminal justice system, whether it be at juvenile justice intervention center on the police department and um, also within your um, within your office. And I guess I just want to ask, is there something that we can do as a council to help? Because those positions exist for a reason. They're budgeted. I know that they were important to the process in my particular district. And I know people have heard me say it before. We have five, five high schools and three universities and um, certainly other resources that can help in terms of the recruiting process. But just in general, not just recruiting, but is, is there anything that we as a council can do to assist you in being a, you know, and getting the job done that you're getting done? Well, thank you, Councilman. Um, I will say that, look, nationwide, this is a problem. So it's not just uh, in New Orleans, uh, not just in Louisiana. Uh, nationwide, there's a shortage of law enforcement officers, and it's a very competitive, uh, uh, we, very, we have people all the time that are telling us, look, uh, I'm leaving, I'm going to Texas, you know, take a job there, I'm going to Georgia uh, to take a job there. Uh, Mississippi has been very aggressive. Uh, we ourselves have gone to Mississippi and Alabama and done some recruiting uh, and offered incentives. So I think, I think money, more money is, is definitely a part of it. But, but let me also tell you that uh, we've been working, uh, Councilman Thomas was a part of this, is a part of this, uh, working with uh, the Martin Luther King uh, High School uh, the criminal justice curriculum. And I think that is something that not only is gonna expose people to, uh, at a younger age to the criminal justice system, uh, and hopefully get them to avoid it, but also get them to understand and appreciate it and maybe find a spot for themselves uh, as they get older. So really exciting program is just getting underway. Uh, and uh, this is something that I think for the longer term, uh, we can really look forward to and, and maybe take that and, you know, after it gets going, replicate it in other institutions, uh, in the city. The number of high schools in the district and um, 
in my particular district, but throughout the city. And I hope that if it's a successful program, that it can be replicated sooner than later. So I look forward to your ideas and I will follow up with Councilman Thomas too. Thank you. Good. Good. A couple of quick follow-up questions and then we'll be done, uh, Mr. Sheriff. I, I do, one thing which we've always kind of enjoyed in this state, and I mean, in New Orleans, and I don't, I mean that kind of a, I mean that kind of as a joke is that how often do you, are your, are your sheriffs recruited to other parts of the state? Is that frequently, not frequently? You know, not so much. Um, when you say other parts, I mean, in this area, we've lost people to Jefferson, to St. Bernard. Um, leaving out of here, not so much. Okay. Um, so a, a point you hit earlier, which I think is really, I want to emphasize it because it's really in our two tier system of having a sheriff and an NOPD. I think you kind of touched on this, but I think it's important for people to realize in most cities and parishes where they have a single sheriff, the typically the path to become an officer is you go to the prison first. And then once you go from the prison, you go through the academy to the prison arm to the streets. And a lot of the synergy there is obviously when you talk to other other departments around the state sheriff's office and the like, the rationale for doing that, a lot of that is because when you have or are a new sheriff or a new officer, you're having those first interactions with potentially uh, dangerous people in a controlled environment. And basically it's part of almost like part of your training before you go into the public and interact in an unclosed environment. And I can tell you, I know many people who are NOPD officers that started off as deputy sheriffs. And I think that any effort we can have, I think sometimes when you look at how we recruit police officers, we think there's a linear path from the NOPD Academy to the New Orleans Police Department to the street. And I think, honestly, we need to explore that synergy some more of maybe part of this process is sending people who need more time or who need more seasoning instead of saying them to the academy, say them to the sheriff's office and going through that lengthier process because there's a reason why so many of the jurisdictions do it. Because when you talk to those sheriffs, they go, man, if I send some of these guys that are on the bubble directly to the street, I'm not doing them or the public a service because they're not yet seasoned to interact with people in an, un in an uncontrolled environment. And so I want to encourage you, and obviously by encourage you, I mean the council, has, you have the council's full support, that if there's any ways we can work to develop that synergy to a greater rate where we can try and figure out where the NOPD and the sheriff's office and kind of feed each other, that would be helpful. I, I am also very concerned that there are, obviously, like you said, there is a national shortage of law enforcement professionals. It's just That's just the reality of it. And you're really, how many recruits for the sheriff's office do you get from outside the city of New Orleans? Like that you recruit actively and came here to be a sheriff? Kind of goes up and down. Um, you know, we, for the most part now, are recruiting from uh, this area, you know, this, this region. Uh, there were times when we had uh, four or five in a class of 20 that were from Mississippi or from Alabama. Um, but that's, uh, that's really not the norm. Uh, most of the people we get are from this community, from this region. But, you know, very well said how you put it about, and, and that's what I had said earlier to, uh, I think it was council member uh, uh, Helena Moreno, that's, you know, I said, look, a lot of people get their start here at the sheriff's office. And, you know, then they go on to the New Orleans Police Department. Uh, we we really don't get mad at anybody when they leave and they go to the New Orleans Police Department. Um, it's, uh, you know, you're right. We're patrolling here in the Orleans Justice Center, and then they go to patrolling outside in the street. So it's, uh, it's a natural synergy. Uh, we have worked with the department, <clears throat> the New Orleans Police Department, to get some of their applicant list, uh, and we want to keep doing that. You know, sometimes you're right. Sometimes they're on that bubble and they don't quite make it, uh, but with the right training and the right experience uh, here, uh, they could be suitable 
uh, for the New Orleans Police Department. So we're going to continue to do what we're doing. Well, I mean, to, to that point, uh, we know this when we had Chief Ferguson on uh, two weeks ago. There are a tremendous amount of people through a very active recruiting effort by that OPD who come in as initial rec- initial solicits for applications, and they just don't meet the criteria to be an OPD. And any effort we can do to support you, even having a crack at that list to try and fill those positions you have that are open, we'll do that. Also, I know that we are currently as a council engaged uh, about to have a very lengthy conversation with civil service on the prohibition on lateral hiring at NOPD. I would certainly hope that as we kind of crack that egg open and we start to look at more national uh, searches to try and recruit people for law enforcement in the city of New Orleans, that we could have greater synergy between the sheriff's office, police department, and maybe recruit for both and just say, say, do you want to be in law enforcement in New Orleans and really just kind of cast a very wide net? Because the reality is, is that if we can really up the ante as far as soliciting uh, recruits, just like, I mean, like you said, Mississippi, Texas, they recruit here, they recruit here, the entire country is recruiting across the entire country. If we can, if we can also do the like, and we could bring more eyeballs here and more consideration here, then I'd certainly want to use whatever resources that we can synergistically. So you can both fill those roles, because like you said, there, there is a great opportunity at NOPD that if you have an officer it's on the bubble, doesn't quite have the right criteria yet, but they can go to the sheriff's office and be seasoned for a couple of years and then potentially be an NOPD applicant at that point. We want to get as many people as possible here to make you both successful, but I appreciate your time. I appreciate always your willingness. I know that there's been a lot of communication about proactive patrols. I know there's a lot of challenges because you are horrifically undermanned at the current time, and I think that it's if there were more bodies available, you'd have them out there doing those things. Uh, to Councilman Thomas's point, I think that you've got a lot of different law enforcement agencies across the city. The last count I had when I had the resolution about eight years ago to look at this, we had 12. We have 12 different law enforcement agencies with post-certified officers throughout the city of New Orleans. All of them are having challenges, but the more we can get all of them to offer up two, three, four officers, whatever they have, that can really become a number that could actually provide some relief. So I appreciate you being here for this dialogue. You're going to get a couple of follow-up questions for data, which you collect pretty religiously so that we can have it as part of our, part of our overall conversations on a uh, crime in new Orleans. And thank you so much, Sheriff. We appreciate you. Well, let me, thank you. Thank you. And members of the council for having this crime summit, you know, I'm, I'm glad the interest, I'm glad we're doing moving forward on it. And let me also say that, because I don't think I said it, enough is that we need more money too. you know, higher pay raises would would certainly help us attract uh, and retain more people. So, but thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, With that, we now have Mr. Glasser. Is he in yet, Paul? He actually just signed off. We'll see if we can get him back on. Okay. Thank you. All right, Mr. Glasser, we're ready for you. Okay, can you hear me, sir? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, good. 
Well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity to address the council. Uh, I know some of you personally, but perhaps not the newer all members. All right, Mr. Glasser, we're ready for you. Okay, turn that off. Mr. Glasser, can you, you may be streaming on YouTube. Can you go ahead and close yeah, I that was. Out? I was, I got it off now. Okay. Okay, thank you again for uh, allowing me to address the council. Um, I know some of you personally and some of the new members I don't know at all. So if you would allow me, I'll introduce myself to them. My name is Mike Glasser. Yep, we can hear you. Oh, so good. Well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity to address the council. I know some of you personally and some of the new members I don't know at all. We're ready for you. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you again for uh, allowing me to address the council. Um, I know some of you. Okay, I think I've got it now. All right, my apologies for that. Um, my name is Michael Lasser. I'm a captain with the New Orleans Police Department and president of the Police Association of New Orleans or PANO. I've been a police officer for 45 years, president of PANO for 16. I've commanded Homeland Security, several police districts, one twice, serves on a staff of two chiefs of detectives. However, I've spent the overwhelming majority of my career in narcotics, vice, and intelligence, which amounts to well over 35 years. And I have been qualified as an expert in all areas of narcotics and addiction at one time or another at every section of Orleans Parish Criminal District Courts. I taught the block of instruction at narcotics at the academy for 21 years, and I've been published. I've served in a narcotics division as a PO1, 2, 3, 4, sergeant, lieutenant, and captain three times, and that is my current assignment. I've been a captain for 15 years, except for one year as a provisional major, and that means I've served in every classified position on the NOPD. I tell you this to explain that my current command staff level rank, I've spent most of my career up to today in street level enforcement, along with the men and women of the NOPD, in addition to my administrative duties. Equally significant is I've spent 16 years as president of PANO. PANO was a police labor organization representing the interests of NOPD officers for over 53 years. We advocate for officers' benefits, working conditions, and very often in disciplinary matters. As such, I get to speak frankly and candidly with officers who are honest about many issues, and for this conversation, why they are leaving the NOPD. They speak to us where they will not tell the NOPD administration the real reasons why they're leaving. They're concerned with getting a bad reference or some other administrative hold on documents for new employment, uh, whether that's real or perceived, but that is their fear. And often they just offer as a reason for leaving a better opportunity, personal reasons, or a spouse got a promotion requiring a move out of town or some other ambiguous answer but they will generally not tell the truth, but they tell us the truth. And that gives me a vantage point that others you may have spoken to do not have, and that would include the superintendent. This gives me the institutional knowledge and historical reference to see things that other people may not get to see. Now, I know you all have the letter I wrote to you describing some of the issues that the NOPD is facing in addressing crime in New Orleans. There's no need for me to read that letter to you verbatim. I think you've all read it at this point, but I will address some things in greater detail and discuss some things not included in that letter. To start with, I've been rescheduled several times, but I've had the opportunity to listen to many of the folks who went before me representing their part in the criminal justice system. And that has in some cases affected what I will talk to you about today. The NOPD in my opinion is the first and I would say the most important part of the criminal justice system as without the NOPD, the rest of the system would largely be vestigial. Without an arrest and a report by the NOPD, there's no case for the DA to screen, no charges to dismiss or accept, no bond for the magistrate to set, no trial or plea for the DA to offer, no sentence for the judge to impose, and no defendant for the sheriff to incarcerate. Now, I've heard a variety of comments by our district attorney describing not having enough arrests by the NOPD for certain violent crimes, or receiving subpar reports, substandard forensics or missing forensics, or lacking witnesses, resulting in too few cases that are acceptable for prosecution. We're hearing about this now, but what has the DA done to address these deficiencies is just presented all during this past year. 
I recall in 2008, as the NOPD struggled to recover after Katrina, the DA then started a pilot program of placing an assistant district attorney in each district to assist ensuring the investigating and reporting officers prepare complete thorough reports that necessary forensic and witnesses were identified and included. It was a, control, a quality control on the front end to help assure that when the DA's office received the report, it was ready for prosecution as best as could be done. Perhaps that could be implemented now, but I saw no such suggestion or effort from the DA, just the criticism. As for identifying suspects and making arrests, the DA who was then city council president pushed for the elimination of some of the tools necessary for the NOPD to be effective in making arrests and identifying suspects. This council with the now DA as its president pushed for the prohibition of facial recognition software, phone signal intercepts, and criminal predictive technology. And now the former city council president's DA criticizes the NOPD for too few arrests and having succeeded in removing some of the very things needed to make those arrests. The DA also pushed for reduction in the budget for the DA's office when he was city council president. Surprisingly, he now asks for a great deal of money for the DA's office that he just took away when it wasn't his to run. And the council seems likely to approve it. And maybe he does need it. Maybe we shouldn't have taken it away to begin with. How is it that the arguments fostered by the DA now weren't enough then to prevent the defunding at the time? Did we suddenly get smarter or do we now just see that it's failing? And we couldn't see that then. I understand the rationale that drove the council to prohibit the tools that NOPD lost, which are in use by other agencies effectively all across the country. I also saw the superintendent plea for an opportunity to provide a detailed plan for oversight that could have assured responsible application of those tools. He was denied. I know that debate is over for now, but I find it remarkable that after personally pushing for the disarming of the NOPD's investigative technology, the DA now criticizes that same NOPD for being unable to identify more defendants of violent crime. It seems that New Orleans is a marvelous environment for coincidence. I've heard that there aren't as many juvenile recidivist offenders with multiple arrests as the NOPD has stated. I believe I heard Mr. Asher state that there were over 200 carjackings in 2021. In 68 incidents, there were 35 charges on 27 defendants of which 24 were juveniles. That's almost 90% juveniles. And while that percentage describes arrests, I bet a Buffalo nickel at the ones that were not arrested were also 90% juveniles, which means either New Orleans society is mass producing juvenile carjackers to the tune of hundreds, or we have a much smaller group of juvenile offenders doing multiple crimes. I believe the latter is far more likely. I heard DA Williams say several times that numbers don't lie, and he's correct, numbers don't lie. But their implication and the inferences drawn from them can be very misleading or manipulated to convey a very different conclusion. Statistics are often like a drunk leaning on a lamppost. They can be used for support as much for as illumination. Take this example. The superintendents told us, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, he told the council that the NOPD confiscated 2,000 guns from the streets of New Orleans in two, 2021. 2,000 guns. That's a lot of guns. It's very impressive. And I don't think anyone can deny that removing 2,000 guns from the hands of criminals had some serious impact on violent crime in the city. What was not asked was what about the 2,000 defendants or however many were actually arrested? Where are they? The guns are in central property and evidence. The guns are in jail. Where are the criminals? What about the people who were arrested in conjunction with their illegally possession or illegal use? Where are they? No one asked. How many were arrested? How many of those arrested were accepted for prosecution by the DA? How many went to trial or were pled down? What sentence, if any, did they receive? Are they still in jail? No one asked the superintendent. No one asked the DA. Our most violent offenders are arrested with the guns used in that violence, and yet no one asks that question. If they are still on the street, they are getting more guns. Unfortunately, there is an inexhaustible supply of guns available. The number of guns confiscated is incontrovertible. The numbers do not lie. But what does it really mean? Mr. Asher gave some statistics regarding the current size of the NOPD. If I recall correctly, he said there were 1047 commissioned officers on the rolls. However, 84 of those are in AD. AD is the Administrative Duties Division, the place where we assign all members who cannot wear a uniform or carry a firearm. 
It may be due to military leave, suspension, pregnancy, injury, any one of a number of reasons. If we deduct those 84 who are not working the street, we have 963. The superintendent also said that there were 60 out for COVID related issues. And while that number fluctuates, it's likely to be more consistent than not for a while until this is better under control. That puts us down to 900 for a department that should have 1600. That's 56% staffing. In researching, I came across a staffing report recently which showed the first district in NOPD in 2005, just before Katrina at 125 personnel. Today they have 75. That's 60% and that is representative of most police districts across the city. To give that more perspective, we lost 150 officers last year. That's the equivalent of two complete districts disappearing. We're on track for the same attrition rate still. The changing of the calendar from December 2021 to January 2022 is irrelevant. The attrition persists. The administration says we hired 44 officers in 2021, but we did not. But the numbers don't lie. Remember, we did hire 44, but they're not officers. They are recruits who may become officers in 10 months, six months in the academy, four months in field training. So in just under a year, we may have some brand new rookie officers, but not now. For now, we lost 150 who are gone and gone immediately with no replacements. We are bailing out a sinking ship with a teaspoon. and We cannot hire our way out of the staffing shortage. Retention is our biggest problem. To add to our woes, the re uh, state police recently announced a lateral academy in June. What that means is previously, anyone accepted for hire with the Louisiana State Police goes through a complete academy, whether they're coming from employment at Burger King or from 10 years with NOPD. But now they are offering an abbreviated academy for post-certified officers who are hired. That means several things. One, we are likely to lose more NOPD officers to the Louisiana State Police since they will not have to go through an entire academy. Louisiana State Police might draw more applicants than might otherwise have applied here. And the LSP clearly now has a burgeoning staffing problem as well. And that means it's that much less likely that they can provide assistance to us here when we need it. And on that topic, I'd like to make mention of one thing. The idea that we can expect to rely on assistance from other law enforcement agencies, unfortunately, is not a viable one. We might get a little assistance during Mardi Gras or some other major event, but we cannot expect an enduring role by other agencies beyond what we already have. We've already expanded the role of the Orleans Levy Board Police and some of the university police about as much as we possibly can. We had an entire Louisiana State Troop in and the CBD in the quarter. They're gone now and they're not coming back. And by the way, when I mentioned historical reference and institutional knowledge, I was widely criticized six years ago when I predicted that the LSP, as good as they are, and they are good, but they would not save the quarter. And here we are six years later, they're gone, and crime is at its worst. On that note, I might mention that I've implored the city council once before regarding fixing the issues that were driving attrition. This is not my first open letter to the council, nor my first warning of disastrous attrition. That warning was ignored as well. The number one problem with the criminal justice system rests with the NOPD. The number one problem with the NOPD is attrition. And the number one complaint of all exiting police officers is NOPD's Public Integrity Bureau. Just as the public rightly expects their police to follow the law and the rules, officers expect PIB to also follow the law and the rules, but they often do not. Their failures and transgressions have resulted in many overturned disciplinary actions by the Civil Service Commission, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, Louisiana Supreme Court, sometimes in Civil District Court. Fair and equitable investigations and resultant disciplinary action should almost never be successfully overturned because they are fair and they are equitable. But they are frequently overturned because they are often not fair and equitable. Moreover, and equally reprehensible, if not worse, some officers who should be disciplined are not, especially those assigned to PIB. They are protected and shielded from the consequences of unethical, improper, and sometimes illegal behavior as they investigate the misconduct allegations made against other officers. The complaints by officers range from continuous and relentless discipline to incredibly trivial, trivial infractions, sometimes real and sometimes perceived, to major infractions which may have criminal consequences as well as department policies and penalties. 
Additionally, procedures not authorized by NOP regulations and ethics and law are routinely violated with no consequences or correction. Now we have petitioned Civil Service Commission to investigate these claims. We've enumerated these claims and given them a list of them. They will simply not wait for the process to occur in, in civil service. Our officers are leaving to work for other agencies and often for less money. Further, many retired PIB investigators have returned to PIB as civilian investigators doing exactly the same job. And this incestuous staffing phenomenon has ensured that the same investigators from the chief on down have remained in place for over a decade. We've requested that investigators be rotated through PIB, but that doesn't happen either. And I can say unequivocally that without an overhaul of PIB, this blue hemorrhage out of the NOPD will continue. The biggest problem amongst the officers besides PIB is the promotional committee. This committee is appointed by the superintendent interviews candidates for promotion through some somewhat unclear methodology, which manipulates the civil service eligibility roster. Here again, one of the components of PIB investigations are used to raise or lower candidates' positions on the eligibility roster. The officer candidates rightly suspect that the manipulation is frequently politically based and have no confidence that the promotional system is fair, equitable, or even legal. And PANA was litigating that civil service as well. Third problem is that there is currently no future career pathway that is attractive to the people we're hiring. They reach full earning potential in four years or less. Other than promotion in the classified service, which I just discussed with you as being problematic, there is not a future progression to keep personnel here. And so we don't. We need a new pay plan. This is not just an across the board raise, but a graduated system of raises for non-ranking police officers, which can be achieved through merit and tenure. And that would encourage them to stay beyond three or four years because they have something to look forward to. And last, the consent decree, which has remedied some very needed changes in the NOPD, but has brought with it the unintended consequences of stifling the work of policing this city. The NOPD is suffocating under the constraints imposed by the consent decree, which discourages officers from being officers and both inhibits policing by those still here and driving officers to jurisdictions that are not as encumbered as we are. There is no mystery to this attrition problem. The police are leaving for very specific reasons and many of which can be remedied. This is a 1600 officer department being operated by 900 officers and shrinking. Now, PANO has brought these matters to the attention of the administration and has followed up on the city's inaction with petitions to civil service and litigation to the Fourth Circuit. The results of this litigation remain to be seen because it's a slow process, but we can promise you this. PANO will continue to try to keep the NOPD together, encourage new recruits to join and current officers to stay. And we will continue to litigate for fair and equitable legal processes. If this administration and this council continue to ignore these things, the attrition will continue and worsen, and crime will continue to flourish. Fewer and fewer police means the NOPD will be unable to render a safe environment for citizens and visitors, not only during the events that fuel the city's economy, but for daily life in New Orleans. I think we've all seen recently the videos that were posted relative to an attempted kidnapping and to a multiple offender shooting that occurred on a busy thoroughfare on Elysian Fields in the middle of rush hour traffic. There are a number of reasons for that, one of which is there just aren't any cops around to deny people the opportunity to do those things. And it's getting smaller. The way we operate and the way that we're attracting people and keeping people or failing to keep people is the result. And it's only going to get worse. It's not going to get better. We have not stabilized. We're still going down. As I said in the letter, the popular definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And the corollary, which is conventional wisdom will not get you out of this problem because conventional wisdom is what got you into this problem. There are things that we need to do differently. And I suggest that we look at doing things differently. Otherwise, you can expect this problem to worsen and worsen continuously. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay. Uh <clears throat> It's good seeing you, Captain. I've got a couple of questions and then we'll go down the line. 
there was an exchange I had with Superintendent Ferguson, and I was literally waiting for you to come online so I could ask you this because I think you will give me the correct answers. The chief said that there is a free pursuit policy in NOPD. And I challenged him because, as you know, I probably speak to, we probably have to speak to a lot of the same officers, but my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the way pursuit currently works is that if an officer sees a crime taking place where it might entail pursuit, they have to contact a supervisor to being able to do pursuit. Now, Chief Ferguson said supervisors routinely grant pursuit. I have heard from officers time and time again, that is absolutely the opposite. They tell them you cannot pursue. And more importantly, if an officer initiates pursuit while waiting for a response, I have heard repeatedly, and Chief Ferguson said this was not true, but I want you to comment on it, that PIB will go back as far as six months and self-initiate an investigation on pursuits that are routinely dismissed, but is merely a mechanism to harass officers who are trying to consider and seek pursuit. Is that correct? That is absolutely accurate. So in contradiction to the police chief, this is a department where when officers see a crime taking place and ask their supervisor for pursuit, they are routinely denied the ability to pursue. To begin with, there are a very, very few circumstances under which we can even ask for and expect the pursuit. Uh, stolen cars, crimes that are not considered crimes of violence, we will not pursue. The regulations prohibit us from even asking for a pursuit and it will be categorically denied. Once we are approved on a pursuit, and that happens occasionally as well, but when we are, there are very, very limited uh, restrictions as to how we can do that, how many cars can be involved and how the pursuit is to go. It's, it's a very lengthy, I, I wanna say it's 14 or 17 pages worth of explanation as to how we can and cannot pursue. And it's almost impossible not to violate some tenant in that pursuit policy, which number one discourages some police officers from even attempting to do it. It discourages some supervisors from authorizing the pursuit. And then invariably, even if the pursuit is justified and authorized, there's always someone that has failed to follow some small rule, some small part of this regulation. And what happens is exactly what you described. PIB will go back and review and watch videos over and over again until they find some indiscretion, some transgression, and then also will be written up. Okay, so the end result is, because this is something that I hear frequently all the time from officers is, the end result is you have officers who are disincentivized to pursue. And those few who actually do get authorization to pursue almost always get a PIB complaint generated against them because after watching video over and over and over again, they will find an infraction in which they get found to be in violation. And what I hear anecdotally is that oftentimes upon further review and the civil service gets involved, the complaint's dismissed, but it's still seen as another disincentive to pursue. You know, that's something that's true. And, and that's something that, that started back when we first got body-worn cameras uh, under uh, Superintendent Serpaz, I remember when we were first introducing the concept and I was asked at the time if I would support getting body-worn cameras because that was not part of the consent decree. And at the time I did support it, I still support it because we felt that more often than not, it would demonstrate that the complaints against officers were unfounded. And in those cases where it was founded, then so be it. However, we found that even though an officer may get accused of some transgression and the body worn camera clearly shows it didn't happen, that complaint will still be open, it will still be in their jacket, and it may sit there for anywhere from months to years before it's resolved. And that's essentially penal uh, penalizes the officer. They can't transfer, they can't go to other places, they can't get promoted in some cases, and those complaints will sit there. So. While the body one camera will eventually exculpate them for the time being, it doesn't. They still have a complaint and it still sits there. Well, I, I want to talk about the PIB investigations. So PIB knows that they're on a timeline to pursue an investigation. 
And something that I also know anecdotally is that PIB regularly ignores the timeline in which they're supposed to do an investigation and will leave an open complaint in someone's jacket for an indeterminable amount of time, knowing that, legally speaking, if they ever do find a complaint, it will be prescribed. But simply by having it camped in their jacket, it's almost like a unenforceable, unenforceable penalty that prevents advancement and prevents transfer. Is that correct? That's correct. And there's a number of ways in which that happens. Sometimes they will just make it a criminal complaint where there is no time frame. That's an open-ended issue. So the 60-day and 120-day constraints that apply to administrative infractions do not apply. Then later on, they can drop the criminal charge and then open up the administrative one and proceed with it that way. Sometimes it's used in that fashion. Other times it just sits or they investigate it, but they don't open the complaint until the investigation is almost completed. And by that time, instead of taking the 120 days that they have at maximum, they've investigated it for four or five months. And then it sits there once again. And officers generally won't leave with an open complaint. It's what we call RUI or retiring or, or resigning under investigation. It's almost like a uh, dishonorable discharge. It's almost impossible to get a police job somewhere else if you leave with an open complaint. And because they continuously open complaints and leave them sit, many officers can't leave. And we have them coming to us saying, if you will just resolve this complaint for me and get it heard, I'm gone. As soon as this complaint is over, the only thing keeping me here is this open complaint. Well, and I guess the, the question becomes, because obviously the law enforcement community is a small community. Part of the challenge in attracting officers, because I think you're right, the pay is com the entry pay is competitive. Do you think there are any current NOPD officers that are encouraging officers or new people they know that want to be offers to apply to be NOPD officers? I think in most cases, a lot of officers are discouraging them to do so, and they're leaving themselves. I mean, that's the problem. If they were leaving policing, I could understand that because there are some national trends that are going on right now that it's not encouraging for officers to be officers. I think you've seen it all. The, the assaults against officers nationwide is astronomical at this point. And the social issues that are involved with police in, in general are problematic, but we don't have people that are leaving to go work in a brokerage firm. They're leaving to go to other policing jurisdictions. And that tells me the problem isn't with policing with them, it's with NOPD. Two more quick questions. The first is, and I think this is very important, I think it's something that the council will likely take action on at some point. I think it's both very obvious and very public that those individuals who are associated with our NPIB who are caught guilty of doing the same infractions as regular officers are routinely treated differently. Is that correct? That is Absolutely true. And that's part of the problem is that complaints that are made, no matter how well documented or how unequivocal that they are, no action is ever taken. Those complaints okay. are buried and they are protected and shielded from any repercussions. They remain in place and they just keep doing the same thing over and over again. My last question before I get to Mr. Thomas, because I see my order up there. So exit interviews and surveys. Uh, that has changed over the years. At, at one point, there were exit interviews where people were actually interviewed as they left. I know that has since turned into surveys. I also know talking to officers that are leaving, many of them don't even fill out the survey if they can avoid it. I guess my question is, to your point, as long as those exit interviews and surveys are conducted in a way where the results of said surveys can get back to NOPD, we're never going to get an accurate depiction of why these officers are leaving, correct? That's true. And that's exactly why I'm here. That's why I'm trying to tell you is that these officers will talk to us. They will tell us the truth because they know, number one, we're going to protect their anonymity and they're not going to suffer repercussions, but they'll tell us the truth. So we hear it while they're here and we hear it on the way out the door and they tell us the truth. And that's why I'm here to tell you that. I'm telling you what the problems are, regardless of what they'll tell the police department administration. They're not going to want to sabotage their, their chances of going somewhere else by being critical at a police department. But they'll tell us the truth, and that's what I'm here to tell you. 
Well, I, th I think something that would be helpful, and I'll certainly work with you on this offline. I've been approached by a variety of different groups that want to be helpful. And something I float to all of them is, if you would give me the wherewithal and support to put together an organization that is a third party nonprofit to reach out to officers that are currently leaving officers that have left to get aggregate information on why you left, just so that we can be able to produce it to kind of support your narrative. I think it's necessary because the reality is, is that I know at least two officers um, who have left NOPD for other jurisdictions that have taken as much as a 50% pay cut because they simply said the morale of the department is so abysmal. And this is not necessarily, I mean, we, we can agree or disagree on some of the specifics of the consent decree, but many of these officers, they were there under Surpass, they're there under Harrison, and they said that uh, many of the problems that you have cited have gotten so bad as of late, they just don't see hope for the department going forward. And I think it's important that though I appreciate you being here to give a voice to those officers who can't, we need, as, as Councilmember Harris always says, we're data-driven. If we could get together a third party that is not affiliated with the police department or the city, just to collect the, that aggregate data and do anonymous interviews with officers who have left or are leaving to provide some of these stories, even in a vacuum without identifiers, so that the public can see their perspective and where they're coming from, I think it's important to realize that when you have a morale problem, you cannot solve it with money. I do agree with you that we underestimate, and part of the data points that we're going to ask from the police department is, because of the way we do pay raises across the board, we're constantly bumping the initial pay without giving real pay increases to veteran officers. And I think that when we're doing pay increases in the future, we need to be much more selective on pushing it towards veteran officers or senior officers, because those are actually the most valuable officers, the ones that have multiple years of experience, five years and more, because we have, and I mean, you can speak to this thing really quickly because we both know it's an open secret. We have plenty of officers that go through our academy with no intention of staying here, that they go through our academy because in the areas with which they originate, that are outside New Orleans, you have other departments across either don't have an academy or they miss an academy and being on the, our roles for a year to get through the academy, to get through um, field, they become a much attractive candidate to another department that doesn't have to pay to recruit them. Is that well, true? That's absolutely true. Uh, a lot of them come on board and they don't even finish field training or the day they finish field training, they quit. They already have their applications in somewhere else and they come here for the training and the experience, which is valuable for both because our training and our experience is very good. And then they go back to some other jurisdiction, ostensibly wherever they came from, and they go back there and they have no intention of staying. You know, we would hope that they would stay, that they would come to love the city as everyone else here does and, and love the job and the benefits that we have here. We have some terrific benefits. You know, we have, we have the best pension plan that there is. I don't know if any other police department has a better pension plan than we do, but this younger generation doesn't care about pension. They can't think that far ahead. They can't look more than three years ahead. And unfortunately, we don't offer them anything. You know, we can do it with data, but let me just put it to you simply. You know, there are two ways of, of dealing with people, the, the carrot or the stick, okay? And we don't offer a carrot and PIB beats them with a stick. People are only going to tolerate that so long and they're going to go somewhere else where they don't have to do it, even if it does mean a pay cut. Well, I think an important thing to remind everyone in the public on this call is the thing you have to always remember is that the people that we lose, not to retirement, but to, a, to another department, these are the people with the cleanest jackets. So the people who are your shining star officers who are leaving and being recruited it's not because PIB found some glaring, horrific problems with them. It's because they got fed up in another apartment, recruited them. So I know the, uh, the rest of the council has a lot of questions to ask you, uh, Mr. Sorry, Captain Glasser. I'll reach out to you offline on that idea regarding that third party survey, because I think that I want officers, especially the ones who left for other for, for less green pastors with less pay, 
to really be able to provide those anecdotal stories. The public needs to hear that this is not simply an idea of you can throw money at this problem. It's a significant morale problem. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Captain Glass, thank you for your participation in your report. Just some questions. Uh, uh, how important is police morale? It's critical. What is the morale of the New Orleans Police Department right now? It is abysmal. That was a good, good uh, uh, adjective that was used earlier. They, the morale is abysmal in most cases. The officers that are capable of leaving are, those that are capable of retiring are. And it's only the ones that are in the middle that have too much invested that they can't leave, they can't take the pay cut, and they can't leave, and they can't start over again. Those are the officers we're retaining at the moment. But as they reach retirement, they're gone. How is it possible for someone to give their best in any profession or in any organization if morale is abysmal? It's impossible. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. You're seeing the results of it now. In, 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 in recruiting, you know, uh, in law enforcement, there's several categories that they rate around the world and here uh, uh, nationally. And two of the six principles of uh, recruiting, there were two that, that, that I thought were important, especially as it relates to our discussion here. Uh, one is uh, officers as your primary recruiter in terms of the, the, if they're trained uh, to be recruiters to grow the force. And the other is uh, youth pipeline to law enforcement. What is our youth pipeline to law enforcement, what youth, youth agencies has the NOPD used to at least uh, entice or give the career opportunity uh, for young men and women to join the force? Well, you know, the policing here is a, a challenge because of the level of crime that we have. And it's, it's not a sleepy uh, Mayberry. We're very, very busy here. And that's why officers join in the first place. They, they join to be police officers and they're looking forward to do that. <clears throat> and when we provide an environment that doesn't allow them to do that, in fact, discourages it from them and punishes them for doing so, they're gonna go somewhere else. And they're gonna continue to do it. They're just not gonna do it here. And okay. I know a lot of officers, you know, they're reluctant to leave. They're very reluctant to leave, but they will, and they do. And one of those other principles that's important is officers as recruiters, if your answer to uh, Council Member Morell is that uh, our current officers, not only is the morale abysmal, but they're not acting as active recruiters to grow the force. Well, let me tell you this, we had, and I assume we still do, uh, have a, uh, an incentive program where if an officer mm -hmm. uh, recommends someone for hire and they get hired, there is a cash reward, a significant cash reward, and if they make it through the academy, there is another cash reward on top of that one. It's very substantial. It has not helped in the least. Okay. Uh, what impact did the uh, Landry administration freeze on hiring in the police department? What impact did it have? And is there a lasting impact today? Well, that started in 2010. Uh, and the rationale that was told to me at the time by the mayor at the time was that the budget being upside down as it was, that it was important to shrink the largest draw on the budget, which is the police department. And so there was a hiring freeze. We didn't hire anybody for a while. And people who were capable of being or retiring were encouraged to retire. And some were draw forced to retire. They were, they were driven to a point where they were encouraged by their assignment or by uh, their responsibilities and humiliated into retiring. And that was the goal and that worked. And I believe from my conversations with the mayor at that time and the CAO that they felt they could reverse that trend fairly easily, but they could not. And the promises that were made year after year to hire a certain number of officers each year to improve the department and, and enhance the numbers never happened. They couldn't make it happen no matter what they did no matter who they recruited from, whatever pool of candidates they sought to encourage or entice, it never happened. We could never get past 11 and change 1,200 
from the almost 1600 we had. And today it's absolutely upside down. Now we're losing people faster than we can replace them. So it's a lasting impact. Absolutely, it's enduring. We're talking about a decade. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's go to the budget. We know that, first of all, thank you for your representation panel, uh, uh, Black Order of, of Police, a uh, Fraternal Order of Police. You, you guys not only go negotiate on behalf of the men and women who are in your organizations, but you all fight to understand uh, the budget principles of policing and how the money uh, is spent. Uh, in looking at the police department, uh, I think it's somewhere close to uh, 190 million, uh, 180, 190 million dollars larger uh, with 600 fewer offices. What's your appreciation of a much bigger budget with fewer people to police? How did we get to that? And in your conversations uh, with the police administration, uh, what's how you know when especially when labor and manpower in any business usually is your greatest cost? How did why is the budget so much bigger with fewer officers to patrol the street? Generally speaking, I'm really not in a position to go over the budget per se and tell you exactly line item for line item where it is. I just don't have access to that and it's not my area of expertise. But I will tell you that there are a number of things that contribute besides just the cost of labor. One is as pay goes up, certainly, and we have had some pay raises in between, uh, and that, that goes up. So you're paying more for the individual also, but we have to replace the fleet. The car, car values go up. We've replaced cars with, with Tahoes and, and SUVs, and the cost of the fleet, the cost of maintaining the fleet was expensive. And building new stations as the old stations crumble and fall down around us. We built some new stations. So all those things contribute to money. We're building right now a brand new crime lab. We're building a new range, which we haven't had since Katrina. We've had to use other people's firing ranges in order to qualify people with their firearms. So there's other things that go into it besides just the cost of salary. A lot of that was capital budget though and FEMA reimbursement for many of those hard costs. I uh, could be, I, and, and again, I, I'm not privy to, to the uh, budget and the line items that are involved. It's just not something- I have I'm a couple more, just a couple more questions. Uh, when you talk to your, your, your men and women and the members of your organization, uh, on average, how many people are patrolling each district? What do, what do they say in terms of while they're out there on their shifts? Uh, what's represented? Well, you know, I said earlier how numbers don't lie and and, they don't, however, you have to understand what they mean. Um, when you say on patrol, you know, the police department will tell you that they have a certain number of officers out there, but that usually includes their detectives and investigators. It includes people who are on duty in uniform in the station. And that includes the number of actual uniform patrol officers whose job it is to answer calls for service. Separating those numbers out is important to get an accurate picture of what you're asking me. But generally speaking, at any given time, it is customary to see now anywhere from three to maybe five officers on a shift in a district. Multiply that by eight, and you probably have somewhere between 35 and 50 cops, depending upon who called in sick, who's out for in-service training or for some other reason or COVID or any other reason, and separating that from the detectives or administrative personnel or specialized units, but an actual, Patrol, you're looking at three to five officers a shift times eight. Uh, in, in, in talking to, to uh, uh, criminal justice ex experts, Dr. Penny, Dr. Sharp, uh, and I keep mentioning this, uh, uh, Dr. Weisberg and, and many of the renowned criminologists, uh, they talk about this thing called uh, the, the law of crime concentration, where special task force and units are put together to concentrate on on hot spots, uh, are we using the law of crime concentration to attack those hot spots that, in many cases, are, are the are the the, the 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 fertile ground for crime that spreads throughout the city? Which principles of policing are they using that they share with you all when you talk about that? The task forces in each district were largely disbanded in May of 2020. 
um, the district task forces, what the, the units called general assignment and narcotics units were all disbanded. And those officers went back into patrol. You would think at this point that you'd see a lot more people on patrol, but that's because the attrition has taken over and everybody that we augmented patrol with are gone. So now we don't have either one. We have very few people on patrol. We have no proactive units. There is one general proactive unit, uh, the VK squad, but it's really an investigative unit, not a patrol unit. And we have narcotics, which is what I run. Mm -hmm. And as an investigative unit, not a patrol unit responding to calls for service. So for the most part, we don't concentrate on those hot areas, except for what I just mentioned to you, VK squad and the narcotics units. So there is not a concentrated effort, given especially when we look at the council's criminologists and the M's Metropolitan Crime Commission, where these hotspots have been the same for maybe seven, eight years. There's no concentrated effort, effort to go to Little Woods, to go to Law 9, to go to parts of Gentilly, to go to parts of Gertine, to say, we are going to redeploy our assets to fight crime here. There's no concentrated effort like that. Not in the last two years. Uh, next, just and I'm almost done. Uh, this uh, new violent crime surge isn't new, not in the city of New Orleans. Well, I wouldn't say it's new. We've been I say it's not new. It's worse now than it ever has been. I think that's unequivocal. Okay, what makes it worse now than those 17 years of 400 and 300 and 200, 280, 290, 310, 424, 412? What makes it worse now and so much more indiscriminate now than then, especially as an expert in, in policing and what you've seen, what makes it worse now? There are two overwhelming guiding principles to that. One mm -hmm. is the job of the police department is to deny criminals an opportunity to operate. We deny them the opportunity to commit crime and we deny them the opportunity to do so without consequence. We don't have enough of us to do that. And the manner in which we are policing does not allow us to do that. The way we are deployed does not allow us to do that. Okay, and that's where I'm going. So the 1970 surge, uh, especially around heroin, uh, the 1980 surge, you remember uh, when the uh, big meetings in City Hall with thousands of people, that, remember the 90s when 3000 people marched on City Hall, of course, you remember 94 and 95 with 424 murders. I do. At the peak of each of those uh, crime surges, violent crime surges, they went down uh, in, in the years sub subsequent. Why wasn't the effort of the downward trend in, in your mind, especially as an expert in policing, why weren't those efforts sustainable? Well, as always, you know, uh, when you say it's sustainable, the problems change over time. You, you pointed out correctly, uh, we had the uh, Talwin and, and Sets problem back in the uh, uh, late 70s and early 80s. We had the cocaine problem that came in the Mario Lito issues in the early uh, 80s and mid 80s. Then we had the crack cocaine problem in the 90s and different crime problems. And as we got a handle on them, as we addressed them, those crimes went down. Of course, we had better cooperation then between the elements of the criminal justice system. And the police department was not restrained or constrained by a consent decree and by essentially no personnel. We have always maintained 15, 1600, maybe more police officers to implement in a variety of policing strategies. Any one of them can work. We are currently essentially a, a decentralized police department when we don't have the personnel to be decentralized. We and there was better cooperation and communication during those days than now. There is, or well, was, yes. Okay, and, and, and lastly, uh, is constitutional policing important? And can, can we protect the citizens of this city with 960 to 1,000 officers? Thank you. How many officers did you say, sir? 960 to 1,000, depending on who's right, because some, some agency says we have over 1,000. You said 900 and something. Is constitutional policing important? And can we protect this city and its citizens with the amount of officers that we have right now? Thank you. 
question. Yes, it's possible to do so and still be constitutional about it. Yes, we can do that. But secondly, uh, can we do it with 960 cops, which we're down to 900 now for, again, depending upon how you want to count it. But we can if we deploy differently. In the current system that we have, we have a 1600 officer department being manned by or staffed by 900 officers. So everything works at 58, 60% capacity. That means nothing works correctly. The best thing for us to do at this point is to make an efficient 900 man department as opposed to an inefficient 1600 man department because we don't have 1600 and we're not going to. The reality is we will never get 1600 cops in, in, in the immediate future. It'll never happen. So we Thank have you. to change the way we do business to accommodate the fact that we have 900 and reprioritize. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Thomas. Council President. Thank you. Uh, Captain Glasser, good afternoon. I actually want to stay kind of in this line of, of questioning um, because this is, this is also where I was going to go about creating more efficiencies within the department and reorganizing the department to be more efficient with a thousand or even less officers throughout the city. What would you think are are workable approaches to creating more efficiencies within the department to increase uh, patrolling and increase response times to calls for service? Going under the premise that our first and foremost, our, our number one priority is responding when people call for the police. When people call the police, they have a right to expect the police to come and come fairly quickly and resolve whatever their problem is at the time. We don't have enough to do that currently as we're working. Like I said, if we have 40 or 50 officers in uniform patrol in the entire city, that's not enough. We can't do it with that number. So how do we do that? How do we redistribute those? Things? Well, number one, we have to perhaps reprioritize where we have the officers we do have. What are they doing and how essential is that? If the number one priority is responding to calls for service, we may have to take it from number two or number three or number four and make sure that we have at least the minimal number we need to make that happen. The second part is how are they distributed? Okay. We have eight police districts. Those eight police districts require a certain number of officers just to man, and if you pardon me using the expression, to staff the, the building, staff the uh, administration of the operation of that building, and all the attendant issues that go along with it. If we consolidated districts down based primarily on demographics, it really doesn't matter where an officer goes to uh, roll call and swaps from a personal car to a patrol car. It really doesn't matter what building they go to. What matters is that we get more on the street than what we currently have. We can do that if we consolidate some district stations down. We can save money on the station itself and the operation of it, but more importantly, we can take those officers that are required for the infrastructure and put them back into patrol where they belong. Doesn't Jefferson Parish, which has actually a much larger land area to patrol, have four districts? They do. They do. So, you know, Captain, when um, the chief was before us um, more than a week ago, I had asked the question, you know, about reorganizing the department and, and potentially creating more efficiencies and about the mergers of, of specific districts, um, in particular, potentially the second and the sixth, because both patrol uptown. Have you heard any conversations of, about potentially merging that that district? Since it, are those two districts in particular? I have not heard it. Um, I would like to hear it, quite honestly, because I think that's the thing we should be doing, and we can probably do that to several districts. You know, when when I commanded the seventh district, which is the largest district in the city. And as I've told people sometimes that the seventh district, New Orleans East, is actually the fifth largest city in the state taken by itself. Only uh, New Orleans itself, Baton Rouge, Shreveport, and Lafayette are larger than the seventh district. And uh, we had a patrol that with 100 police officers. And that's not enough. But when I was asked where we should split the district, if we were to split it, I, I encouraged them not to consider splitting it. Because if you split the district, then you got to build another district station and you have to staff that district station with officers. And if you have those extra officers to put into a building, give them to me now. Let me put them on the street, let them patrol, 
where we are because it doesn't matter what the number is on their collar breast in a uniform shirt. What matters is that we have officers on the street and I don't want to waste them manning a building for no particular reason. It doesn't matter. So my opinion was we don't split it. And likewise, there's no reason to have, say the two uptown districts, the sixth and the second, which are demographically identical, to have two different district stations. We can merge those easily. Also in trying to get the most out of our manpower and efficiencies, um, the chief said that they're really, you know, we're, we're very few remaining opportunities for civilians to take on um, positions within the, the NOPD that are currently um, uh, utilized or that are currently um, being filled by officers. Do you see any more room for civilians to cover um, different jobs that officers are currently doing? You know, I, I don't. I've, I've noticed that trend and I realize and appreciate that there's some effort to relieve the police department of some of the burdens of calls for service that they are required to handle in an effort to, I always hear the term, to free them up to do other things. But the fact of the matter is I don't see where the officers themselves are really in any way uh, tied up doing those things for the most part. Not that they don't have to be done, but they're really not doing those things to begin with. It's not going to change much. There are certain things by law they can't do. For example, traffic investigations and traffic accidents and things are not, not something that can be handled by a group of civilians. There, there's some very serious state laws that, that constrain that and that requires uh, a, a commissioned officer to handle. But more importantly, some issues like domestic disputes and whatnot, while some people feel compelled to send uh, social workers, and that may be beneficial on the back end of that, by back end meaning after whatever initial conflict is resolved that the police were called for, then perhaps they can become involved. But from a safety issue, one of the most dangerous things that officers come across is domestic violence issues. I think we just saw on television the result of uh, those two NYPD officers that were killed in a domestic violence issue. And that happens all the time. You don't want to send social workers into that. And that's not the environment to send them in. Once the conflict is resolved and once it's settled down, certainly you can do that on the back end. But I don't see where there's room for a lot of civilianization for what we do. Our problem is not code enforcement. Our problem is not traffic accidents. Our problem is violent crime. That's the problem. So Kevin, is, is, you know, going in a direction that I was going now going to ask you, um, because you prompted me when you started talking about code enforcement. So recently the administration and the chief just pushed these deputization ordinances where city employees would now be deputized. And this was really, you know, put out there, like this was going to um, overall help lessen the burden um, for NOPD officers to go, you know, deal with violent crime. But is, is this set of deputization ordinances really going to help in that regard, in your opinion? No, it's frankly, it's, it's frankly not going to. Um, there's a lot of things that sound good on their face, but when you drill down on what has to happen with them, uh, not so much. You know, we started this process Oh, probably about eight years ago when Mayor Landry tried to introduce the NOLA patrol program. Uh, after a million dollars and a year later, they were doing the exact same thing, code enforcement. Where did it go? We spent a million dollars and in the end it was completely defunct and, and offered no solution whatsoever. So you can rename it, you can reheat it, you know, you can warm it back up again. And will they do something valuable? Uh, probably not. Maybe a couple of circumstances you can conjure up where they might, but is that going to impact the NOPD and their ability to police the city? No, it will not. Let me, uh, just a couple more questions. I have a question about retention. Is there anything that the city council can do in working with civil service to create, you know, additional carrot? You know, you and I have talked before about uh, within the ranks, potentially creating additional divisions. Can you can you talk about that and and whether it's it's a worthwhile track that we we should we should go down? Because if it is, I certainly would like to work with you on it. I would say it's not just worthwhile. I think it's critical. Um, 
And let me just say this, uh, four years ago, I presented a pay plan to civil service, which ultimately was adopted and, and approved by the city council, not in the form that I gave it at the time, because at the time I included some things that would have provided a career path to keep people. That was cut back by, by the police administration. And what we ultimately passed was good, but it wasn't enough. They, they cut out the most essential part. Uh, that was disappointing to see that. But when we did institute that plan, in fact, we announced it in July of 2000, I think it was, uh, not mistaken, 2017, we announced it, attrition dropped 50% just on the announcement of the plan, which was to take effect in December. And from December to last December, a year ago, December uh, 2020, we, our attrition was significantly lower because we kept people from retiring. But once they got their three years in, because that's the way our pension system works, you are entitled to the average of your three highest consecutive years. So once they had their three years with your pay plan, then they left. So it worked for a while, but they cut out the most important part. And that is the ongoing carrot. And, and we're not talking about retirement issues. We're not talking about ranking officers. We're talking about our line officers, people that graduate our academy that we want to stay here and, and keep working here. And because they reach maximum earning capacity in three to five, three, four years, they see no future. And that's why they're leaving. So the pay plan, similar to what I did last time and what I'm going to give to you very shortly because I have it just about completed, uh, is a suggestion on how to keep that carrot ahead of the game. It doesn't require a ton of money, uh, but it's a graduated system whereby there's a constant incentive to stay just a little longer and stay just a little longer and stay a little longer until it's a career. And it works in other places. And I think it's necessary to work here. We clearly see it's not working, but we have now, okay? Even though our starting pay is higher, they're taking pay cuts to leave. So we have to make it, we have to give them a future when we don't have one. And that's our number one complaint beyond PIB and the promotion is no future. Uh, I've already given you my commitment that I'm going to work with you on that retention pay plan, um, and we can certainly do that together and, and with this with this council. But you know, once again, as you mentioned, um, we can throw money at the situation, but the morale issue is really significant. So let's talk about PIB. Um, PIB, uh, you mentioned that there is a significant number of uh, turnover as far as like cases reversed by civil service or the courts when they're, when PIB cases are, are brought to, to either civil service or the courts. Do you know what percentage are reversed? Do you have any of those numbers? I don't because I don't have access to that, but I have met with the IPM and we posed that question to the independent police monitor who said she was going to take a look at that and see, and see if she can find out exactly what percentage of cases are overturned and which investigators are turned over most frequently. And that was something she was going to look at. So I'm looking forward to that information, but I don't have and access to it. But I do know from experience, we have quite a few that are turned over just from personal experience, but I have not tracked exactly how many I don't have access to that. And, and I'll follow up um, on that um, as well. The officers who work in PI. How are they selected? How long have they been there? Tell me about that. While there's a small number that have turned over recently, and that's, that's just due to attrition, uh, if you will, but a lot of the people out of there have been there for a decade or more, and some of them have retired and come back as civilians doing the exact same job, so they don't leave. They just stay there, and they've continued on and on. It's just the exact same core of individuals that stay there for the most part and never leave. And they are protected. If, if, if they are in any way written up for any, any violation, it's basically buried and ignored. We never hear back from it again. So how do you fix PIB? Is it rotating in new people? How do you fix it? I think to begin with, you have to have someone leading that, that organization that people have confidence in that, that is going to do the right thing. PIB is a very necessary component of the police department. We need that, it has to be done, but it has to be done fair and equitably. 
and they have to be good about it. And they're simply not. They have to be the bastions of following the law and the rules and the regulations, not the people who get to skirt it, but the people who, who live it and show by example. And they're not, and that's the problem. So it starts with the chief and then it goes on down. And I think it should be a rotating assignment where we rotate people in and out so they don't live there. You shouldn't make a whole career out of that, just like anywhere else in the police department. You don't make a career out of one place unless it's uh, an investigative function that requires specialized training in many cases. But in this case, it isn't. I've heard from officers that, you know, and yes, PIB is certainly important in departments, but that PIB within the NOPD is excessively punitive. Can you give some potential examples of, of what that means? I just want the public to understand, you know, what type of infractions are receiving severe penalty? Well, of course, the most severe penalties are, are those that have criminal implications or are not prosecuted criminally, but, but, but could be uh, or might be depending upon circumstances. For example, uh, uses of force. Uh, of course, that's, a, that's become a very, very delicate subject at this point. But we have in many cases, uses of force are extremely, extremely trivial, or we're really cutting, uh, uh, splitting hairs on, on how that's done. And it'd be, uh, it'd be difficult for me to give you an example that, that, would, that would really match that. But uh, I'll give you one, for example. We, and, and we have, go ahead. For time purposes, what I'm hearing is, and use of force, I mean, that is like a, that's a significant accusation. I'm talking about, you know, I'm hearing that officers check the wrong box on a police report and, you know, that there's a severe penalty coming after that, or that they may like mouth off a little bit, you know, um, into their, their, um, and it's heard on their cameras. And, you know, that's like a really severe penalty. So that's what I'm hearing. What you're hearing is correct, that sometimes even though there may be a complaint and the initial complaint is found to be unfounded or they're exonerated on that complaint, they'll continue to, to watch the video or look at the paperwork and see if they can find some, some minor indiscretion and sustain it on that. It may not be a huge penalty, but they add up, especially if you have more than one penalty. Sometimes it's enhanced because it's not a first offense. So sometimes the penalty is enhanced because it's not a first offense, but we're talking very trivial and minor violations that they actually have to hunt for to find, even though the original complaint may have been unfounded. Well, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Like I said, I look forward to working with you on the retention pay plan and um, hope to get something to civil service, you know, sooner than later with the support of other council members. And uh, council, uh, council member Morell, I turn it back over to you. Your microphone's muted. Council member, your mic's muted. Sorry, two quick questions. Uh, I got permission from Councilmember Jerusa before I asked. Um, I think it's important, Captain, to explain to people when you talk about the morale of the department. I think it's important to kind of give them illust an illustrative example, and the great one is calls for service. Um, the average call for service it would be great if you could tell people, generally speaking, what is the average call for service that an officer in NOPD responds to versus a Jefferson Parish or St. Bernard call for service. And I think when you tell them that, people really don't understand why an officer will leave a department, but if the call for service differential is double, triple, or four times what it is, but you're making less money, your quality of life is significantly different. So can you give us some ideas of the differences of call for services based on the departments? You know, the calls for service in any police policing jurisdiction are not, are not different uh, other than for here, our violent crime level is significantly higher. So while you may get mostly domestic issues in Jefferson Parish with a few burglaries here and there, and they certainly have their share of crime, but it's not at the level that we have. You know, we had over 200 carjackings last year that, that were reported, uh, you know, that alone. We have hundreds of shootings. We probably have, uh, I'm going to, if I remember the numbers correctly, we probably have on the average two shootings a day in this city. 
we had 232 homicides last year. I mean, that's, that's an incredible number of homicides. Remember, a shooting is nothing more than an incomplete homicide. So we have a lot of attempted homicides and by luck, by divine providence or by whatever reason, a lot, a lot more people don't die, but they certainly could have. So our, our volume of calls is enormous, and especially for the number of people we have answering. So of course the officers are encouraged to quickly dispose of a call whenever possible to go on to the next one, because we wind up with having what we call code two calls, which are emergency calls, getting stacked up one behind the next. And who do you, who do you answer and who do you ignore at that point? So you just do the best you can to resolve the ones you have. So no call gets the attention it should get, which is defeating in and of itself when you know you should do more, but you can't. And the ones that you don't even get to answer, those are even bigger problems. You know, I and hear- the, And the second question real quick before I get to Mr. Jeruso. Um, recently you saw at the shooting that they had at the Holly Grove playground, that the classification that was given on an OPD was that it was a batter, it was an assault by firearm. To your point, and I agree, when you fire 72 bullets at a woman and children, that is attempted murder. It's by grace of God, it was not a murder. Do you agree with those types of classifications where you see obviously there was an attempt to commit a murder, but then they're downgraded to an assault? And I'll turn over to Mr. Druso after this. I'm turning you on right now, Joe. I would think it would be the other way around that most often uh, a shooting incident is an attempt murder. It's only on certain rare circumstances that you could say, well, there was no intent to kill someone in this case, certainly to shoot them, but no intent to kill them, or perhaps the shooting was, was, was inadvertent in some, in some way. The overwhelming majority of them, you point a gun at somebody and, and pull a trigger one or more times, it is pretty evident that you should expect the end result to be death serious injury or death. That to me is an attempt murder. And I don't see how you can do it any other way. Okay, thank you, Mr. Druso. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Captain Glasser, thank you for being here today. Um, I wanna to start out with actually one of the first things you said, which was in the past that ADAs had been in each police district. Is the purpose of that, Captain, to help with screening of cases and to help work on reports? Well, I wouldn't call it screening. What it was uh, at the, back at that time, and it was in the district that was in the seventh district at the time, and I had uh, ADAs working in the district. Uh, their goal and their purpose was to advise officers, especially on the more complicated crime scenes, to make certain that they have included everything they needed to include. The forensics were included. Witnesses weren't overlooked. Uh, that probable cause existed, and of course. With the DA's office, it's more than probable cause. They need proof beyond a reasonable doubt, as you know, to secure a conviction. So there are things that, that the officers can do to improve that report and to help the DA's prosecute later so they don't have to do it on the back end and use DA investigators to help tidy it up. We do it on the front end. So having those DA's there, they could help improve the quality of the report that we deliver to the DA on the front end. So it sounds like... It sounds like listening to you that there are a couple of purposes, actually. One purpose is the very beginning is to make sure that probable cause is established and whatever is in the gist and the warrant is, is appropriately secured so you don't have to deal with that later. Is that right? That would be one, yes, sir. And then and another is sort of what I would characterize as back ends, making sure that the DA had whatever he or she needed in order to build a case beyond a reasonable doubt. Is that true? That's also true, yes, to make certain that everything that could have been done was done. And the reason I'm asking you, Captain, about this is one of the things I asked the DA about is 701 releases the other day. Are you familiar with 701 releases? Yes, sir, I am. All right. And so, um, you know, one of the things I've been told repeatedly is that what typically happens is that the NOPD and the DA's office work together to make sure reports are properly secured so the DA can timely bring a charge. Is that right? That's correct. Um, have you seen lately that there's been a connection with NOPD and the DA's office giving NOPD notice of, hey, we're 60 days out from being the charge, 45 days out from being the charge, 30 days out from being the charge? 
I don't see where there's adequate notice very often for that to happen, because if it were, I know the district commanders would certainly not allow that to happen if they were aware of it. And that it's common practice, right? So NOPD knows where the DA is in terms of um, the, the correct timetable. And then NOPD is also, for lack of a better term, on the hook to provide the necessary information in a timely fashion. Absolutely. So it's a help to everybody to make sure that there's this sort of, for lack of a better word, tickler system in place. That's exactly correct. Okay. And, and I think you've said this already, but obviously what you want to do is to be able to be in a position to help the DA uh, in securing necessary convictions, particularly in violent crime. And if it means that certain evidence needs to be secured, talking to victims needs to happen to make sure that the correct witnesses are being talked to, that NOPD is prepared to do that. That's correct. Yes, sir. All right. Um, I, 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 a lot of my other questions, I hate to tell you, are just going to be finer points of what my colleagues already asked you, but some of it is just to make sure that I understand. And so I, I just, again, want to bear down a little bit on the fact that we have this differential between what the budget is built for for NOPD and then how many police officers we have right now. And I want to make sure I understand the, the pay issue in a second. But are there additional carrots we can be offering people in the force right now? I mean, is, is there, I know, and I want to see what Councilmember Harris is thunder because she has some, some big ideas on what she wants to do. But in terms of laptops or vests or equipment and cars, I mean, what are the type of things intangibly that you hear from officers that, that maybe NOPD isn't getting that other jurisdictions have? Well, it's, it's kind of a broad question, uh, but I'll, I'll try to answer it this way. Most of our personal equipment, that would be a vest or, or personal equipment, uh, we purchase on our own, but we have a fairly generous uniform allowance that allows that to happen. And once you have your initial outlay coming out of the academy, uh, maintaining it is not that difficult. So for that type of equipment, we're not. Now, fleet-wise is a whole different matter. You know, how well the cars are running and how well the equipment is operating. You know, that's another story. Certainly when it's not, that's, that's a, an impact on morale when, when there's no cars to be had. And I've been told in spite of some of the new cars we have, uh, I'm hearing from officers that many times either ranking officers can't leave the station because there's no call, car for them to drive or somebody has to come pick them up or they have to get a ride from another uh, rank from another district to get to a crime scene because there simply aren't any cars. And that's a problem. And I, I can't speak to exactly how many we have in the fleet. I don't have access to that information, but I know from the back end is what does that translate to? And I have ranking officers that can't leave the station because they don't have a car, or we have to double up officers because we don't have enough cars. Why we don't have those cars, why they're not being repaired or why we don't have enough, I, I can't answer that question. I can only tell you that we don't. And yes, that's a problem. Most other jurisdictions, almost every other jurisdiction I can think of, all have take-home cars. And the purpose of a take-home car is not just a, a benefit because people don't drive it around to go to, the, uh, go to the grocery store so much. It's the idea that they maintain those cars themselves. They keep very good, good care of them because if they don't have it, they don't have it. So it's not a pool car that they're gonna leave for somebody else to fix if something is loose or broken and let somebody else do it. They're very particular with their own cars. And that's why most other jurisdictions, if you go around the state from the state police, Jefferson Parish, Kenner, all those departments all have take-home cars for that reason. That while it's a big expenditure on the front end, in the end, they find their fleet lasts a great deal longer. That, that makes perfect sense. And, and I, look, I know we're asking you a lot of questions that you don't have the information to per se, which is a little unfair, but we just want to make sure, again, as you're talking to people that, that we get the best you have. And if you don't have the data, we, we appreciate that. But we, you know, we, I guess, are, are looking for some, uh, whatever factual information you have that can be supported by anecdotal information too. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the compensation system. Um, uh, is, is the issue, Captain, one of compression, that sort of what happens is if you're in the force for three years or whether you're in the force for 10 years, that potentially the three-year officer and the 10-year officer is making the same amount of money? Well, other than the two and a half percent raise every five years, which is what we call longevity raise, we only have two grades of police officer. 
you enter, exit the academy as a police officer, and then you have an opportunity to become a senior police officer, which generally happens uh, in three years, two to three years. Once you hit that, the only other place you can go is to become a detective. And if you become a detective, you get a 10% raise, but that's it, and you're done. And there's no other raise other than those five-year increments. Every five years, you get 2.5%, but there is no other raise involved unless you take a test to be a ranking officer. That takes some time, and those tests are not given as frequently as they're supposed to be. They're, they're, I will concede that they're just starting to do that more frequently now. But as I told you earlier, there's a problem with the promotional issues that officers are not feeling that they're fair and equitable. So they're not, a lot of cops just don't want to be a, a, a supervisor. They just want to make more money doing the job they're doing. And they can't do that. So there's no future past the third year. They see that as, okay, now what do I do? And the answer is nothing. You just keep going where you are until you're tired of it. Well, it doesn't take them long to get tired of it. Well, I, I, so I guess the, let me ask it this way. In other departments where you may have to wait a period of time to go from, you know, whatever the, the police officer rank is, then to detective, um, do they have raises based on seniority then? So, you know, every three to five years, if you decide to stay in that pay class, putting aside, you know, the cost of living raise, you also get a seniority bump. Some departments have that, and I can't speak to what each, each and every department does. I can tell you our initial pay is significantly better than most other departments in the area. But like I said, once you hit that third year, then you don't have anything left. And, and Therein lies to, the problem. To put, a, to put a like sort of point on it, do you have an idea of how many sort of officers are in that that? rank right below detective and then how many can rise to be detective in a, in a four or five year period? I mean, again, I know I'm asking you questions you don't have all the data for, but just trying to give people a sense of how hard it may be to go from one rank to another. You're probably looking at about 600 officers out of our 900 that, that would fall into that category. Okay. All right. Um, I think, I think, you know, obviously you've heard from council member Moreno and we've said this, you know, I think repeatedly to other departments and agencies, if there's civil service issues that we can help people work through, we want to be able to do that because we realize retention it, it is an issue, number one. And number two, um, it, you, you seem like you touched on this. We've had other agencies also tell us that it's better for somebody not to be in a supervisory role for a variety of different reasons. They don't have the headaches. They can make more money. They don't have paperwork to fill out. And, and obviously we want people to graduate as, as makes sense and to retain them as, as best possible. Right, not, not everyone wants to be or should be a supervisor. Some people just want to do their job. They just want an opportunity to earn more doing it. You know, we have, uh, I recently had uh, an 18 year homicide detective leave to go to St. Tammany Paris. I know he took a pay cut and he had 18 years in homicide here and left anyway because there was no incentive for him to stay. We, because there was no fi financial incentive or is a morale incentive? Both, both. All right. And then I, I, I know Council Member Moreno asked you about this and obviously we've all read your letter. I would say from my perspective, the most significant piece of it is based on PIB. Um, it, it, I, I guess we're just grappling with you know, what is the way to try and address that most quickly with the greatest sense of urgency? You know, about, I want to say about a year, now, well, almost two years ago now, I, I checked and found that there were over a hundred cases in PIB of criminal violations alleged to officers that have never been addressed. A hundred, which is ridiculous. How do you have a hundred cases of allegations of criminal misconduct that go unaddressed? And part of the reason for that is because there's no prescription on it. They open up a criminal investigation. They are not constrained by the 60 day or 120 days that an administrative violation of. So they take it, they put it on the side and they just leave it. There's no rush, rush for it. And it just sits there. And many times officers don't even know they have it until they try to get transferred someplace and they have to get a copy of what we call a short form from PIB 
indicating what the disciplinary record is, and they find that they have a criminal complaint for the last two years, sitting that they didn't know about. And then we have to struggle to get that resolved. Now, I'm pretty certain PIB has gotten that number down significantly since we brought that to their attention. I think they've got it down, but still the problem persists, okay? That things are not handled the way they should be. And the way to fix that is I think we need a new chief of PIB that's gonna overhaul it and have them start replacing personnel and just have them do fair and equitable investigation. And I heard you, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's not that complicated. And then you also said one of the problems too um, is that if somebody has, has a PIB charge in their jacket, they're essentially prevented from looking from other employment as a result of that investigation remaining incomplete. That is correct. If, if, if they have an open investigation and they, uh, if they leave, they're called RUI, which is resigned under investigation or retired under investigation. And it's almost impossible to get another policing job in another jurisdiction because nobody knows why they left. It could have been something trivial, like they missed court for a day and they would have gotten a letter of reprimand, or it could have been something uh, extremely important, something that could have been fired for. They don't know and they don't want to take a chance. So it's almost like a dishonorable discharge. So they have to wait till those complaints are resolved and disposed before they can leave. Is there any mechanism that a police officer can avail himself or herself of to fast track that? If they go to their rank, if they go to their captain and say, look, I, I this has been sitting in my jacket for 90 days. I need it resolved in the next 60. Do they have any recourse? Yeah, they come to us. Right. Right. Yeah, they come to us and, and we call PIB and we try to get, get it resolved and before we have to file some sort of legal action. And usually we can get it uh, sped up at that point, but we have to know about nope. it first and we have to do each case individually. We shouldn't have to do that. You know, the fact of the matter is PIB is an essential part of the police department. And if their investigations were done properly, we would almost never win an appeal. I mean, the only thing we appeal on is either the officer didn't do what they're accused of doing or what they did do wasn't the violation or that the penalty was not fair. Those are really the only three things we have to argue about. And if they were fair and the officer did what they were accused of doing and the penalty was consistent with the violation, what would we win on? And the answer is nothing, but we do. And we win frequently because those things do happen. They don't happen. Yeah, I, I'm with Councilmember Moreno. I, I think part of what would help us is is assembling those facts, and I think Councilmember Morrell said it as well. So we could we can see where they are, and obviously, as we're trying to figure all of this out, um, you also just said something in closing out um, about obviously you want a fair system. What you're really looking for is predictability and 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 urgency here, right? I mean, that's that's essentially what you're looking for. That's correct. Okay. Um, and so when you talk about a violation, is it a violation of an NOPD policy or procedure? In most cases, yeah. They're administrative, we call administrative violations versus criminal advisors, yes. And, and, and I'm sure NOPD, and I mean, I know it's on the website, has tons of policies and procedures that are available. In your experience being on the force as long as you have, how long does it usually take a policy or procedure um, to be drafted? You know, that varies. It depends. Some of them are complicated and require a good deal of, of, of regulation and other things, not so much. So, you know, sometimes they can be put together in a matter of days or a week. And some of them take, take a while to uh, really explore and research and see what prevailing uh, uh, best practices are and other departments may do that have addressed similar problems and see how they've done. Because sometimes these things wind up being litigated later on. If other departments have already handled it and already litigated it, they can save us a lot of trouble. We know exactly what the what the jurisdiction and law prevails on that, so we can we can shape and mold things that will prevent us from being litigated against in the future. But some things are fairly simple, and some are more complicated. So I can't give you a, a, an average on that. I, I'm not asking for an average, but I'm, I mean, I guess what I'm just trying to understand is if if there's concern about implementation of a policy. Would it make sense that certainly within a couple of days to week, but three to four months would be enough time to draft a policy 
um, based on research and looking at best practices and obviously trying to avoid litigation somewhere else. Does that sound about right? I can't think of anything that would take longer than that. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Captain Glasser, for your time and for your letter and for being here. Thank you. Still on mute, Mr. Chair. I'm done. I think everybody just wants to know who's next. Thank you. Sorry, Councilmember King, while the mother mute was on. Councilmember King, apologize. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Moran, uh, Morel. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mr. Glasser, uh, thank you for sitting here for quite some time. I appreciate it. Can you explain to the public um, the importance of public support for our officers? We talked about morale earlier. Can you explain to them how important it is to have the public and the community support for the officer's morale? You know, public support is really critical. It's absolutely critical. Um, you know, we expect our officers to respond to situations that most people would, would want to run away from and we expect our officers to run into. And they have a right to expect that. That's what we signed on for. But we, of course, need the public support. We need to have people have confidence in us and what we're doing and to appreciate what we're doing. You know, do we get paid as much as we should? You know, uh, probably not. In some cases, never. You know, most people don't go to work with the expectation they're going to be shot at today or, or get killed or injured or seriously injured. Uh, we do. And we know that and we expect that. But we also expect, hopefully, that people will appreciate that we do that, just like we appreciate the fact that firemen will run into a burning building and try to save someone. Most people will run the other way. They have to run in. It's the same thing. And any first responder, EMS, police, and fire, you know, we do the things that, that people don't have to do and shouldn't have to do. And all we want really is just the support that goes along with that. Thank you. I think that's important to hear because a lot of folks don't realize how tough it is to be an officer. And, and um, you put your life on the line every day to get bashed, it makes that job just that much more difficult. So thank you for that. I always had this idea of uh, training or yeah, training our high school young men and women to become NOPD officers. So when they're junior or senior in high school, they're, they're taking some classes, they're kind of getting familiar with the process. They may partner with Delgado to take some further classes. So once they're able to become qualified for NOPD, um, they're just that much more trained. And in the meantime, while they're training, they can they can do some, some desk work jobs or maybe kind of put on patrol to do some, I don't know the word, to walk around and kind of be not proactive policing, but just help NOPD being visible. Do you think that is something that could help with the manpower shortage with NOPD? Well, years ago, we had a cadet program, and that's exactly what that was. Uh, people of high school age could uh, uh, become involved at, at the district station or someplace where they were not exposed to the kind of dangers that an officer would be, but to give them a feel for what police do and how it's done and see if it's something they want to become a part of. And we had that program and it was fairly effective. Uh, we used to have it way back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it kind of faded out over time, but that's something we could certainly look at doing and it wouldn't be a bad idea. Okay. Do you think it would be a good idea for NOPD to partner with the sheriff's office or other agencies to, to help with the, um, I, don't, I don't mean just like a task, a task force or a gang unit, I mean like every day have certain law enforcement agencies help NOPD patrol certain neighborhoods? Well, certain agencies, while similar, they have a different job. For example, the sheriff's office, their job is largely corrections. It's not patrol, it's not policing, it is corrections. They, they man court buildings, they're court bailiffs, and they're in corrections. They do some warrants and some subpoenas, and they have some duties like that, but they have a different purpose and they have a, a different uh, uh, 
command structure and their obligations are different from ours. Now we do have some concurrent jurisdictions. We have Harbor Police, we have Orleans Levy Board Police, we have a variety of, of university police departments. They also have restrictions as to where their, their jurisdiction goes. And I know we have expanded that. Um, I can tell you the Orleans Levy Board controls way more of the lake area than they ever did in the past. And they've taken on a huge burden. I, I gotta give a shout out to uh, Kerry Najolia from the Orleans Levy Board because uh, he has helped tremendously in that area. They handle a lot of accidents and they take a lot of burden off, but that's the limited resource. You know, it's not on, on the ending. They still have their own things to do and we can't rely on them to continuously support us, especially as we shrink, because as we're losing personnel, we're gonna need more of them. And it frankly isn't more of them. They have their own problems. So that's not an enduring issue. Part of the problem that I saw six years ago, we brought the state police in. One of the complaints I made was that I knew that when we brought them in, we would not fix the things that were driving officers away. We would allow them to be the Band-Aid for the time being. And they were the Band-Aid for a time, but now they're gone. And with them being completely gone, the problems that we didn't address then are roosting now. Do you think it's a good idea to bring back the state police? They're not coming back, sir. Okay. We had an entire state police troop here, Troop N. We at one time had 100 troopers assigned here. They're gone. And they're not coming back. Not in that kind of capacity. So will they come during Mardi Gras or during Jazz Fest or some other time? Perhaps they'll, they'll donate some. But... You know, they just started a lateral academy, which is something we had some years ago. Uh, and they never had that. I don't care where you came from. You could have 30 years in another department. You come to the state police, you're going through the academy day one to the day end. Um, and that's the way it is. And they just started a lateral academy. That tells me that they're having a staffing problem as well to offer an abbreviated academy to try to attract people. And if they're having a staffing problem, to the point where they're offering a lateral academy, I don't think they're gonna be in a position to offer us any kind of enduring support like we had before with Troop N. I don't think you're gonna see that anymore. As far as the promotions, the captain promotions, it's been explained to me that the interview process that you spoke about earlier, along with the person's history, their discipline record, all of those go into place along with a test to help get a better qualified officer that promotion. What are your thoughts on that? Well, let me say two things about that. You know, one of the things that I have, I just feel compelled to mention is that I've, I've heard the superintendent say this, and I've heard it from uh, in, in other venues that we had for the first time, we had a captain's test in uh, 2021 for the first time in 17 years, which is true. And while the department takes credit for having done that, the department really didn't want to do that. That was a result of eight years of litigation by Pano in an effort to make that happen because the department refused to give a captain's test until finally the courts forced it. And we won in the Fourth Circuit and we made that happen. So while they take credit for having done so, they did so basically at the point of a gun because they didn't want to do it. We made them do it. But that being said, your question is, is well taken in that we believe that there should be some consideration to those things that the test does not test for. Obviously the test cannot tell you uh, tenure. It can't tell you what experiences you have or how, how your disciplinary record was or whether you've had awards or commendations or what your education level is or any of those other things that would be important. The test does not take that into consideration. And it's not unreasonable for the superintendent to want to know those things and have those things factored in. Our problem was how they're factored in. And there was no uniformity to how that was done. For example, job history. One of the things we had in those interviews was job history. And the way they were rated was you either got a score of 100, 50, or zero. Now, I don't know how you can score a zero in job history. How do you do that? If you were here and you're here long enough, qualified enough to take a test, let's say for captain, how could you have participated in the NOPD long enough to be qualified, to take a test for captain and get a zero in job history? How does that happen? Or even a 50, I'm not sure. What is the criteria for that? How does that work? And why is there nothing in between? Why does it have to be either 100, zero or 50? 
and that changes your position on a list. If you're a 50, as opposed to 100, you would drop 10, 12 places. But I don't know how that happened. The second part to that is who determines where you work in the police department? We don't transfer ourselves. The superintendent of police authorizes and is the only one authorized to transfer someone to a particular assignment. So if you want to punish somebody for not having a varied assignment or didn't have assignments that you think are as valuable as others, who is responsible for that? Well, superintendent is because that's who put those people there to begin with. If an officer, for example, worked in property and evidence and hasn't worked the street in 10 years, whose fault is that? That would be the superintendent who assigned them there. And if you wanna hold that against them later and say, well, we think you should have a more diverse job history, then why didn't you send them there? They can't transfer themselves, they don't have that ability. So you can manipulate where somebody falls on a list based on where you want them to fall on the list. Those are the things that we're talking about. So should we measure those things and keep those, those parameters important? Yes, we should, but it has to be done in a way that's fair and equitable and transparent, and it's not. All right. You mentioned the seventh district being the fifth largest city, if it was a city. Um, what's the population of the seventh district to the best of your, ability, your, best of your knowledge? You know what? I, I, I don't recall what it is. I, I, when I looked up the numbers, I, I checked the numbers against the population of those cities. I can tell you it's, it's uh, slightly less than Lafayette, but I don't recall exactly what it is. But I want to say, I, I'm, I'm going to get you somewhere around 80,000 people, if I'm not mistaken. So, I that, so don't hold me to that. So 80,000. Uh, so my question is, you have a a district in the, in the fourth in Algiers, which, which is roughly 60,000, without the luxury of a neighboring district to, to help cross district lines, we, we're next to Jefferson Parish. So is it an idea to split the fourth district up with, with 60,000 residents? I wouldn't split any of those districts up, but quite, quite the contrary. It was uh, other than the fact that the, the uh, uh, geography prevents it in the fourth district, but so many other districts in the city, I would consolidate it, not split them up. Well, you, you, you say consolidate. So would you, right. So it, it is not a good idea to have two districts in the, on the West Bank? No, it would not be. Uh, I, I think you'd be inviting, again, a, a wasted resource of individuals to both operate a building and operate a, a, a district station for no reason. If you have those cops available, put them on patrol. Don't put them in a building. What about a substation? Same thing. Okay. If we have a substation, what happens with a substation? We have a building that sits there and officers come to the building and they, they, they park their personal car to get into a police car and then they leave and go handle calls for service. So we have either an empty building or we have a cop that sits in a building. We have a cop sitting in the building. What's he doing? Watching Netflix? What are we, what are we doing? Put him on patrol. I, I see no purpose to having a building there that that's a false sense of security that people may have, but in reality, it doesn't accomplish anything. The goal is to put more officers on patrol and more officers in an enforcement position, not tie them up manning a station. And can you tell us just how much, try to quantify just how much maybe a scale of one to 10 is the consent decree hurting our police department? You know, if I had to put it on a scale of one to 10, I was going to say at this point, it's an eight. Okay, because some of the things that that consent decree did, a lot of the things the consent decree did were necessary. They were changes that could have been made and should have been made sooner. And we could have done it without a consent decree. We could have saved ourselves $60 million and just done it ourselves. There's enough consent decrees in enough cities out there for us to have looked at and said, let's take a look at what, what we want out of these things, put it together, and we'll make our own plan up and we'll implement it as we can, when we can, and as we can afford it, instead of having to do it the way we've done it. Unfortunately, that along with the benefits, the unintended consequences were that we have been unable to police the city effectively because that's not the goal of the consent decree. The goal of the consent decree is to govern how the police interact with the public in interviews and stops and detentions, traffic stops, interrogations, how do the police interact with the public? That's what it's for. 
it's not about fighting crime or how should we deploy officers or where we should deploy officers or, or how we should utilize resources. It's all about how we interact with the public. And for those things, it's fine, but it's going way beyond that at this point. We're nine years into a six year consent decree and we're hamstrung by it. There's a lot of things we just can't do and we don't do. And what you see is the crime problem you have right now. Would, would a joint effort between the administration and city council, other, other elected officials, um, going to the federal judge asking for a consent decree to be modified, would, would that be beneficial in your opinion? I think the, the answer here is to find out what it is they need to do to end it. And for us to be in the ability to run our own department and not run it through the federal judge or the federal monitors. They have a different agenda, quite that simple. The agenda of the superintendent of police is to interdict crime and for public safety. That's not the goal of the consent decree. They have a different goal in mind and their goal has taken precedence over that. At this point, like I said, we're nine years into a six year consent decree. What is left for us to do to get this over with? And modifying it isn't the answer. The answer is ending it. We've done enough. How much more money do you want to spend on it? And how much more do we have to do? It's a, they keep moving the goalposts back. That's all I'm saying is fix the goalposts and let's reach it. And last question. You mentioned earlier that the previous district attorney had a plan that would put a district, an ADA in each district. Is that correct? We actually had that plan. There were DAs in, in each district back in 2008, yes. And, and have you ever had any contact with our current district attorney, District Attorney Williams, about re-implementing that plan? I have not, not yet. All right, so I think, I think that's a good idea. So I would suggest and hope that you have that conversation so we can have better reports, which will help judges do their job and everyone win. So just keep that in consideration, have that conversation. I'd love to. All right, thank you. Chair, I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Green, you're up next. Thank you, Chairman Morrell. I appreciate this opportunity to speak and I thank Captain Glasser for giving us this time today to share his opinions and also his insight um, relative to what we can do to make our city safer involving the various components of law enforcement. So many great questions were asked by our members of the council and they, sh they should be because they are so motivated to do something about this. It's no mistake that one of the first big issues that we're taking on is this epidemic of crime in our city. And um, I'm just so excited that our council is so focused on this and it's begun to get a lot of conversation started in our community, not just all negative conversation about maybe there is something that we can do about this. So. Um, so many questions were asked. I don't want to belabor questions. I do want to take time out to commend, um, and you talked about public um, support, and Councilman King talked about public support, and I know all of our other councilmen recognize how important that is. I want to take time to commend at least two officers who on um, last week um, were called to a domestic violence situation and were shot on, were shot upon, and did not return fire to cure the area and the police department um, with the assistance of whomever it might have been who was appropriate, engaged in hours and hours and hours of negotiations that resulted in a very favorable outcome in terms of someone being arrested without additional shots being fired, without additional injury. It was unfortunately injury to the suspect's mother, but not by the police. So at the end of the day, um, I know that we all recognize that officers are many times put into situations that require them to go into the heat of battle um, in places that a lot of other people would not go. So that is just one example of what I want to say in general is that I appreciate the work of those who are involved with our New Orleans Police Department as either on a patrol level or an investigative level or a leadership level to do what they can to do what they can to help to reduce crime in our city and make our city safer. You are in a unique position because you are in a position that you stated at the beginning um, involves officers coming to you when they can't feel that they can't go to other people for whatever reasons. I don't know if all of it is justified, but you've said that that's the case, that many officers come to you. I want you to, if you will, 
and this is going to be an obvious thing. Please share that this city council wants to help as much as possible. We are willing to have talked about the issues of civil service. You brought public integrity to our um, attentions based on a letter that you sent and your testimony today. We recognize that there are initiatives that existed in the past that maybe we'll look at now as for promulgating for the future, such as a, an assistant district attorney in every district station. We've heard you loud and clear. I want you to go to whatever offices come to you and express concerns and let them know that the future is brighter than the past in terms of the support of this city council. And I can only speak for this city council because I speak for them all the time. I mean, I speak with them all the time that the future is great and that we need them now. This is a period of significant concern relative to crime in our city. And we need them to communicate with you and to communicate with the with the department's leadership, the NOPD leadership and the DA as necessary, in addition to other areas to express their concerns so that we can all work more together to reduce crime in our city. I appreciate the role of the law enforcement in our city in keeping this city safer. Right now, unfortunately, I make plans based on incidents that have happened to me and based on incidents that have happened to others that are altered because of crime. I really want to change our view of crime in our city and make our city safer. And I just want to say to you that whatever we can do as a council, you've heard it before, please don't hesitate to come to us. You sent a letter to us that has had significance. It's been referenced a couple of times here. We want that kind of correspondence as often as possible. And thank you for the decades that you've dedicated to your work. Um, you have been around for a good number of years and have seen a lot. And while, while I recognize that there can be controversies associated with your position, the fact is, is that you are in a position to talk to a lot of officers and we need to have your input and your suggestions so that we can make our city safer and a better city. So thank you very much for the time that you spent and thank you fellow council members for our commitment to addressing this, the most important issue in our city right now, and that is making our city safer. Thank you, Captain Glasser. Well, thank you. It, it, I can tell you that uh, having the ability to appear before the council and talk about these things is very encouraging for a lot of officers because they haven't seen that before. So I can tell you that they're very encouraged by it. We appreciate the attention that you're giving as well. All right, uh, Councilmember Harris. Captain Glasser, thank you for appearing. I'm not going to be a dead horse. I do want to talk about not only carrot but also stick. Um, we've talked about increasing pay based on merit and based on time served. Are there any other incentives that you can think of that could help with uh, recruitment and retention? Well, once again, we, we talked about PIB for one thing, yeah. it's a necessary component, but I think it needs to be overhauled. We talked about the promotional system and I, I think that we just need greater transparency and a greater system of, of identifying those things that the interview process is designed to uncover and identify. We just need to have that be codified in some way that officers know why they scored the way they did and what they were looking for so that they feel it's fair and equitable, which they don't now. Uh, we're looking forward to an end to the consent decree at some point. Like I said, they keep moving the goalposts back. I'd just like to find out where that is. Where does it end? And last but not least, you know, we need to have a future. And that's what we're lacking right now. You know, we've, we've had problems where the fleet wasn't so swell and you know, we've had a double up on cars and this is an event driven economy. So we all know we have to work weekends and holidays when, when, when those things come up, we know that when we sign on. But when an officer goes to roll call and there are six people there and then two weeks later they go to roll call and there's only five and then a month later there's only four and then there's only three. I remember being a night supervisor and coming and seeing one officer for the eighth district, which is the French quarter on a Friday night for 11 o'clock p.m. for the 11, 11 to 7 shift, 10.25 to 11, one officer showed up and that's all I had. I had to pull officers from other districts to come in and help cover. That's very demoralizing for officers that, that are working to see everybody leaving around them. And that's not a safe environment. They can't do the job they were hired to do. They can't protect the public. And the 8th district, by the way, runs from Calliope to Franklin Avenue. So that's an awful lot of ground for one officer to cover. Okay, that's it's impossible, truthfully, and certainly can't do it safely. So they need to fix that. So those three things, the four things, 
If we can do those things, I'm confident that we can stem the blue hemorrhage that we have. And then if we redeploy people, if we just reshuffle the deck to make effective use of the 900 we have, and ultimately maybe one day a thousand if we if we can move that that back, then we'll be effective. Right now we're we're suffering with 60 percent, 58 percent staffing across the board. Every place is working shorthanded. By the end of the summer, it'll be 50 percent. What'll it be by Christmas? Where's the threshold? Where does it end? Where do we reach a point where we say, okay, now we have to stop and do something different? I think the time to do something different is now. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I do have questions though about other incentives and ideas about incentives like partnerships with universities to provide free education as an incentive, but also tying that in with a term of service. So that's the question about a stick. My understanding from talking to the superintendent is now there's a two year contractual period. And I'm assuming that's when someone signs up to be part of the recruitment class. Is that true? I'm sorry. A two year contract period? Oh. or new officers. Is that a thing? You know, I, they've tried that in the past. I, I don't think it's enforceable. And I think it's one of those things that, that while it sounds good on the front end, uh, it's largely unenforceable. We'll, is, it cur is it currently in play? Is that, is that currently a policy? I don't know if they're still doing it. They did it at one time. I don't know if they still are, but I can tell you that we have people leaving constantly right after field training and and the moment they're off field training they're going or they're going within a year so if they do have it it's it's on paper but it's not not enforceable so any testimony that retention is affected and impacted by this two-year term is not correct is that right from your perspective practical matter it's of no value okay um, I have spoken, I, I speak to NOPD officers often, um, including the commanders of the districts um, in, my, in District P, um, but I think I get the best information from the officers who are actually on the ground. And one of their things about morale, one of the things that they've said about morale is because we're so short staffed that they are moved around to the various districts and therefore they can't have any real relationships with their fellow officers or the people in the communities in which they serve. Have you heard anything like that? Well, I, I don't know about the officers themselves with, with other officers, but certainly it's very difficult to uh, in any way cultivate a rapport with your community when you're constantly running from one end to the other, handling calls and encouraged to dispose of that call as quickly and as efficiently as possible to move on to the next call. You never really have an opportunity to do that. Now, I know we have some policies and procedures in the districts in order to try to cultivate that and try to build some rapport with the community on a variety of levels. But unfortunately, we're getting to a point where we're gonna to have to reduce that and put those people back on patrol because the fact of the matter is, while it's important to have a rapport, it's more important to keep people from being riddled with bullets. So as we make an effort to determine where we need those officers best, that would be the better place to put them. I think people would be a lot happier if they could walk their dog without having a Glock screwed in their ear and, 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 and Rob, than they would be whether or not we have a, a barbecue. So while we'd love to do that, the fact is we can't do that in some cases. And it's demoralizing to have to do it that way and not be able to build a rapport with the community at all. And I think it's important to build that rapport with the community because that engenders effective community policing. I feel more comfortable calling my local NRPD officer because I know that person. So I think that was the point of community building and having officers being able and stationed in a community where they have that trust with the people. In an ideal world, that's great. And we would love to do that. That's kind of the way we used to do business. But that's when we had enough people to put out there when we came to a roll call and we had 12, 13, 14 officers in roll call, not three. Understood. Um, on the operating the district stations, and I know we talked about that a bit about consolidation. Um, I just wanna quickly ask, what does manning a station entail? And do you really need an officer to do that? Could you have civilians operate effectively a station? You could, but I'm not sure why you would. What's the purpose? You know, uh, some of our stations are already closing at night. They close at 8 p.m. and open up again at 8 a.m. or 7 a.m. And they open up in the morning at 6.30. Uh, 
So they're closed half the time anyway. What do we need them for? We, either we need them or we don't. And if we need them, then that's fine. But if we, if we need them, it's because there are police functions going on that civilians really can't do. On the other hand, if we don't need them and we close them for 12 hours, we could probably close them for 24 and save all those personnel. And that's the point. So effectively having an unoperable station, meaning there's no one at the front desk or, is that what you're saying? What's the purpose of having the building if it's empty? What is it doing? Other than the fact we got to heat it, cool it, supply it with office equipment and computers and so forth. If there's nobody there to man it, what's the purpose of it being there? I think I, think I understand you, but I certainly want to have more conversation about recruitment and retention but we've been on this call for a very long time and I appreciate all of your time here today. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Glasser, there are no other questions. I appreciate you being here today. Uh, I appreciate your candor. Uh, like I said, I will follow up on you. I do think, uh, I do appreciate how much, how much effort and work Pano does into representing the people of the New Orleans Police Department. I do think there is some merit just for data purposes of visiting with you and seeing what we can do to have possibly a third party who's not NOPD meet with some of these officers who've left or who are leaving to talk to them about why they're leaving. Just because I do think to be candid, whenever you have a third party come in and verify what you're already saying, which I have no doubt they will, it has more impact to the public. Because right now, I I'll tell you, and I'm sure you saw my hearing, our conversation was very different than my conversation with the chief, who made it seem like when it came to pursuit, it was like a wonderful My Little Pony universe where everyone who calls for a pursuit request is granted it, and no one has any complaints, and that PIB doesn't pursue one unfounded complaint, and it's a magical place. And I think that there are two different worlds that people think of when they think of NOPD, and I think the more we can have somebody, and like I said, I, I completely understand, believe you me, the, the reticence of officers to talk to anyone if it could ever get back to the NOPD because PIB, PIB and rank are nothing if not punitive. And you and I would have to work out what that looks like. But if we could get that data from people saying, no, I did not leave over the pay, because you know that's the argument they make forever. If you just give us more money, we could solve all problems. And money does solve certain problems. But when you got an underlying significant morale issue, you're not going to money your way out of it. And the reality is, is that especially when, and you and I both know people that have left this department for a pay cut because they're just done. And that tells you that this is, this is a real significant issue. And I just want to get your commitment. We can visit with this afterwards and try and figure that out because I think that hearing those stories, not attributed to a person of, I left, and here's why I left for real, will go a long way to informing the public of kind of what's really going on, not the NOPD brass version of what's going on. You know, I, I would agree with you, and I'll only say this, that I, I have absolutely no objection to a third party or anyone, for that matter, uh, if the officers are willing right. to talk about them, is the whole point. Uh, but the fact that we have officers that are leaving and going to other jurisdictions for a pay cut has to be somewhat compelling, okay? It's it, very it's compelling. Not policing, it's not policing, okay, that they're leaving. It's here that they're leaving, and they're willing to take less money to do it. That's a, that's a clue in our business. We call that a clue, okay? And that tells me that there's things going on here that they're not going to experience somewhere else, and they're willing to take a pay cut and not have to experience it. That's what we have to fix, the things that are driving them away. I 100% agree. I look forward to working with you on that. Thank you so much. And as uh, Councilmember Green said, please feel free, and we encourage you to be as candid with the council as possible when you see things happening, because you are the person that's speaking up for the rank and file of what's going on. And as you've seen just in this last two weeks, your perspective and the perspective of the rank and file differs dramatically from the brass and they count on you to let us know what real officers are experiencing. So thank you so much. We appreciate you, Captain. Thank you, sir. All right, next up, we have number four, which is a update from Gordon Plaza residents. I do want, I'm gonna let Mr. Green speak, but I wanna kind of give everyone an update who's watching on the call. <laughs> 
um, we will not have residents. We first off, we got no response from the administration whatsoever on this topic. Um, beyond their press release, we have no timelines, we have no data, we have no actual follow up to provide to Gordon Plaza residents that there is anything on the horizon to happen based upon the releases that have been sent out thus far. Uh, if anything, I think I speak for many council people when I say that we have significant concerns about the size of this land use RFP that's going out to look at uh, the Gordon Plaza site, which has already been surveyed to death. As far as having another group go, go out there and survey it, I'm very concerned. And I know that I spoke with council member Jeruso on budget we're going to have some scrutiny over whether it's even necessary because it will add additional time to any kind of any kind of whatsoever um, benefit or any kind of, of effort to resolve the Gordon Plaza issue. And the simple size of that contract is staggering. And we're going to get to the bottom of that. I know Mr. Green will want to speak for a second. I know the Gordon Plaza residents are having a separate press conference on their own views of the mayor's mayor's press release. But Mr. Green, go right ahead. Thank you, Councilman Morrell. And uh, I just want to reiterate the um, concerns that I have relative to um, the Gordon Plaza residents who have been dealt in injustice for many, many decades. Um, it's been talked about for much too long. And I know that you had a press conference today and that you appeared at the Martin Luther King Monument and that there have been additional meetings. I share your concerns and I'm going to do what I can as a council member to make sure that this relocation, which the mayor said is going to happen in the last week, but um, this relocation be done in as timely manner as possible because every day is a concern. Um, in my remarks before um, the group assembled at the Martin Luther King Monument on Martin Luther King Day, I quoted Martin Luther King's um, remarks where he said, there is sometimes really a time when it's too late, but we need to get things done now. And I will emphasize the fact that it needs to be done now. Every day that an injustice continues at Gordon Plaza is a day that is a very negative um, thing on our city, um, a negative development for our city. So I just wanna let you know that I am going to be in contact with the administration as much as possible and that we as a council are going to use the influence that we have regarding budgetary matters and hearings and the like to make sure that this process moves forward. I encourage you to continue to communicate, especially with the administration, um, the Cantrell administration and the council, because this is an important matter and you can't communicate with us too much because we know that you want to get something done today. I'll be talking today during the Justice and Beyond meeting. I've accepted an invitation. I wish that I could tell you more, frankly, residents, but I can just tell you that there's an impassioned desire on the part of the council to provide relief for the citizens who have been for, who have been the subject of this injustice for so long. And I know that you had a press conference today, and I've been in communications with many of you. We're going to get this done this time. And I'm looking forward to being able to one day celebrate the fact that the relocation has taken place and that an injustice which was long overdue has been finally righted. So thank you all very much for your passion. I understand it. And you've got an ally here and with the council especially, and I believe, and with the mayor's office to getting a resolution of this matter. But there are some things that we have to take care of on the council level. And just as um, Council Vice President Morrell has said, and Council President Moreno, Moreno has said, we are going to resolve those issues and we are not afraid to be out there in the forefront making things happen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. At this time, uh, I believe that we have to, uh, go ahead, Council, Council President. And, um, just on the same topic, or the topic because, you know, it, I've been reading if you all have, um, and residents have and you know there is this victory around Gordon Plaza and it looks like you know victory is coming our way and we're going to be getting money from the federal government well the council has already set aside 35 million dollars so why not start working to move out the families now and then have the federal government down the road reimburse us to me that just seems like an overall common sense approach to get this situation resolved so um 
I would urge that we do what, whatever we can to move in, in this particular direction, particularly since it has been now announced that there's been this victory and that this federal will be coming our way. I would also like to mention that I have been in contact with um, the residents of Gordon Plaza and they told me that while they too have been reading these news releases, they have received no communication for quite some time from anyone in the mayor's office. And so, you know, this, this is their lives and their properties that their news releases are going about. Yet there, is, there has been no contact um, with the individuals at Gordon Plaza about what's actually um, happening on the federal level um, and the negotiations that could be happening on the federal level. So I wanted to, to make sure that the council was aware of this and also um, the public. Council Member Mark. Thank you. At this time, I believe we sh are we going into an executive session, Adam? That, that is correct. We're, we'll need a vote to go into it, though. Okay. Uh, I, do we have a quorum of members? I think we have three of three of five. That is a quorum. All right. Uh, I will entertain a motion to go into executive session. Is there so moved, Mr. Chair? You and Councilman Green. Druso seconds. So. <laughs> Mr. Green motions, Councilman Druso seconds for us to enter executive session. Uh, members, please check your email for a link to executive session. We will return after executive session. Actually, council members, we're going to run the executive session on this Zoom. If you give me one minute, I'll uh, remove um, everyone besides the members and council. Okay. Uh, and I'll let you know when we're ready.